There it is. All right, you ready? I'm ready. Cool. Here. And we are live. Jack, how's it going, man? Good, Brent. How are you doing, man? Thanks for having me on. Is that what you're supposed to say? Thanks for having me on? Uh, I, I think somewhat times. I don't know. I don't have a script that I read, so I'm not sure. I'm doing good, though. How are you doing? Outstanding. Uh, no, no complaints at all. That's good. So for the people who might be listening to this or watching this and wondering, who is this Jack Baruth guy? Is that I say I'm, that I'm right? I'm wondering that. Yeah, yeah. I'm also wondering that. And you did say it right. Okay. Who is uh, he? Yeah. Who are you? <laughs> okay. So are, are you are you asking me to say? So I will. Um, okay. I started I uh, started racing and I guess well we called it freestyling back then. Does anybody say freestyling now? Uh, I don't think so. But... Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, started started racing and, and riding in '86. Um, broke my neck in '88. Uh, came back, turned pro with the NBL in 1990. I had a easily the maybe the third worst pro career in the history of NBL BMX. Maybe the second worst. I don't know. The only guy I ever beat on a regular basis was Steve Buddendeck. Um <laughs> and uh, I didn't even beat Hal. Um, and then um, <clears throat> so I ran a mail order bike shop back then. I had one of the first BMX websites, which was uh, BMXBasics.org. At one point in like 2001, we had half a million people a month reading the site. I did nothing with it, didn't make a penny from it, um, which just seems really stupid now. Um, have designed a bunch of frames, worked with, with various people, have ridden off and on, uh, took a break to folks on racing cars. Um, I got I had a bad knee surgery. I went to Woodward in like 04, and my knees just didn't work. I'm like, I'm going to go race cars. And then my son uh, started racing very much against my will, and so now we ride together and I'm back in it, which is, and the way I met you was um, Brian Horak, he had me come out to see uh, the premiere of No Promises in the, in the theater, which was unbelievable, and just, it was enough to, uh, it was just enough to completely um, reanimate my, my love for the sport, what you're doing here in Ohio, and since then I've seen you at Rays a million times and I'm just, you know glad to have a chance to talk with you heck yeah so there's also a whole world of things that you're a part of outside of bicycles that some people might find their way here from but for the people who don't know about that do we have a quick like rundown on that yeah um, I've been racing and writing about cars for two decades now I've raced around the world uh, Sapong uh, driven the Nurburgring in Germany, um, won a couple of awards in Pirelli World Challenge, which is a pro series, raced in what they call IMSA now, we called it Grand Am at the time. Um, I've got a race shop that shares a property line with Mid-Ohio that I just finished building a couple months ago, and I run a bunch of cars. My wife is a regional champion in uh, NASA, she runs a MX-5 Cup car. I run a couple of radicals, which are like little, um, it's hard to describe them if you don't know, know what they are, but very small cars with pretty big engines. Mm -hmm. And um, ran a Honda Accord in World Challenge, which was a pro series. And uh, have been running the same crummy Plymouth Neon amateur <laughs> race car for like 15 years. And <clears throat> besides that, I've driven McLarens in the GT3 and GT4 programs with uh, Motorsports in Action and KPAX Racing. I was a contributing editor for Road and Track for a long time and worked with a bunch of people there. I was first person to test the Corvette ZR1 when it came out in 2013. Uh, run data on all sorts of cars. I, I wrote the Performance Car of the Year feature for Road and Track for years, did most of their race car testing. Uh, went to work for an insurance company for three and a half years. Um, just left them a little bit ago. and. Um, and uh, don't know what I'm going to do next. So that's kind of a car thing, too. Dang. What a friggin' <clears throat> life. That's awesome. There's a lot to that. And the main reason that I asked you about doing one of these is because I feel like there's some similarities in the things that we, like, do currently or some of the mindsets we share in where we fit within the industry as far as, like, you and the racing and car side of things and me in the BMX industry. And I kind of was just curious on your perspectives on that. 
Well, hey, Brent, that's a lie because you're the most positive force in Midwest BMX. <laughs> and I got, I've got i been banned uh, three times from racing san- sanctions for conduct and hitting people and putting people in the life flight and all sorts of stuff. So we're, we couldn't be more opposite there. But, you know, oh. the, the funny thing is so the, the bike and car overlap is unbelievable. And mm. it's... <clears throat> And it's, it's not just the whole thing. Like, if I take a Haro Master to a... Uh, like, I, t- I take a bike to every race where I can, right? And I'll go bunny hop over stuff and just kind of ride. Of course, you always see a lot of BMX bikes at the races. The endurance races, you'll have two dozen BMX bikes going around. Um, and not department store stuff, but people on S&Ms and fits and standards and, and things. <clears throat> There's a big overlap in competition. Um there's a guy I don't like to talk about him because he kind of depresses me. This dude, Tyler Hoffman, who was um, USA BMX Cruiser Champion this year, national champion. I think he's 38, and also came pretty close to winning a pro race championship. Um, you've got Riley Sawyer, who um, I don't know if you've run into him, but he's an SCCA national champion, one of the youngest of all time, and a uh, competitive BMX racer and downhill racer. And so you do see uh, and. You know, again, I talk I talk to people everywhere from the lift lines to rays, and it, it's unbelievable. Even somebody like, oh my gosh, uh, Noah Kleptash, who mm-hmm. um, you know is running that Miata and also out there doing all sorts of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's it's a huge overlap. And the 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 only real difference, in t- I mean, it's just it's kind of the same mindset, and I think. To some degree, it's it can be you like like with riding it can be you versus yourself. You know, mm. I don't I don't see you doing a lot of um, USA BMX freestyle or any any of that any of the sanctioned stuff, right? Mm-hmm. You're progressing the sport by yourself with your group. As far as I can tell, the only the only person you're really going at is Brant Moore. Yeah. You know, you'll set a challenge for yourself and you'll work on it. And you know, we have we got time trials for that. We've got um, you know people we have drifting, which is it's a lot like that actually. And in the same way that you have people who want to compete, who want to run X Games, who want to do, you know, Red Bull Rampage on the big wheel side and stuff, we've got a bunch of pro racing. And, uh, of course, unfortunately, you can, you can get killed in both, which yeah. um, happens more often in the car than on the bike, I think. Yeah, I would I would guess, but it does unfortunately happen in both, which is sad. But something that I think we accept as bike riders and car racers yeah, and you can you accept that you can get hurt. I mean, oh my gosh, I I broke uh, three ribs at Angel Fire about six months ago, and you know people say to me, "You're 51 years old. What do you, how do you break in ribs? How are you breaking ribs on a bike? You know, where you where you you know <laughs> you're riding at the ice cream shop and you fell off or something?" I'm like, "No." <laughs> um, so yeah, and so the bike and the car scene, it's, there's a huge overlap. You've got guys like Bob Haro, who was a, a pioneer of the sport in BMX. And who is obsessed with cars? Uh, cars were a big part of when we got started. You know, uh, Stu Thompson, guys like that, jumping over a Porsche 930 Turbo. Um, there's so this is embarrassing, but I had I had a 911 for like oh gosh 20 years, and I kept thinking I'm going to jump over the thing, just like just like in the magazines. Mm-hmm. And I never had the right ramp or anything. And finally, I went to sell the car. And I thought, you know, I I haven't um, I haven't done it. I got to go do it. And so I went to Mike's with my son, and, and we're, we're talking about this. And I come off that turnaround on the back corner, like the new one, where you go down the hill and around. There's a there's a there's like a little pop-up and pop-off. Okay. And I hit the wall, and I, so I snapped my wrist. I'm like, well, I guess I'm, I guess I'm out of it now. I don't have to. I can sell the car. I don't have to jump <laughs> over it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the, the car and bike overlap is, is huge. And there are guys like uh, Schultz Design Works where – they they do BMX graphics. They do car and, and mini truck graphics. Um, I don't I don't think I think if you were to go to any kind of major amateur race and say how many people here ever took a gate in BMX or dropped in on a quarter pipe, I think you'd get a th- between a third and a half of the people raise their hands. Uh, yeah, it just seems like there's so many people who start riding BMX and then end up in the car world. <clears throat> At least from my experience. Yeah, and uh, you know, I was surprised. I have, I think I've, I've Laird Frame 299. My one of my park bikes is a Mike Laird bike. Had it for a while, 
And the number of people have come up to me at a track or a racetrack say, is that a Mike Laird bike? Hmm. Like, how do you know who this guy is? Yeah. And so, oh, I, I saw that bike on his Instagram. So, it, it, you know, it is. It's a big overlap. And then what's kind of depressing is I'll have a lot of people say, you know, well, God, I wish I could go to the Nürburgring and race or I wish I could do all the stuff that you've done. And what I always want to say is, you know, if there's a button I can press – and I can be 25 years old and able to run any downhill line in the country or a- able to do the outside line of profile world without, you know, throwing up. You can go race the Nürburgring. You know, you got your whole <laughs> life to do that. You only you have a limited amount of time on the bike when you can really accomplish what you want to do. Yeah. And to me, that's the real gift. Everything else you, you got. You know, I tra- I've trained hundreds of race drivers. I st- and actually I started off training BMX racers back in the day. And I kind of went from that to training uh, drivers. And I can I can train a 60 year old to win a to win a pro championship if he's got enough money. I cannot train a 40 year old to drop in. I just it just can't. You know if you've never done it before, it's it's impossible to explain and put that muscle memory into somebody who's my age or, or a little bit younger. Yeah, and that's funny because I attempt to do that. <laughs> There's times where I attempt to do that, but. Uh, I feel like I kind of want to go back to it. You mentioned that you started racing in 1986. Yeah, I mean, it was weird. You know, it was, you know we rode a dinosaur to the track. And was, was, my son likes to make fun of me. He says, how, how did bikes even work? I'm like, they didn't. Hmm. They didn't work. Yeah. Um, my first bike was a Redline 600C with a forklifter stem and mild steel bars, one piece, uh, one piece cranks. Uh, 36 inch single wall rims, uh, half inch, you know, half inch pedal axle Mm -hmm. and everything, everything slipped, everything moved. Um, I got a DK stem pretty early because the forklifter was trash. Don't ever race or I would never, I wouldn't do a two foot bunny hop on a forklifter stem, but, (laughs) um, you know, I got a DK stem that led to me meeting Charles and Billy Danishek and Jared Raflick and a lot of the people who ended up doing system cycle and dk yeah in Ohio. but the bikes were so terrible brant i can't oh my god i i bent frames doing stuff that clearing six foot gaps you know it's it was unbelievable how bad the bikes were and um and a lot of them were made on jigs that had no precision to them. There's a company called Baden Company. I raced Super Class, which was Junior Pro. I think they call it just Junior Pro now, not Elite. But I got the bike, and the brake bridge was so far away, I couldn't run the Odyssey Pit Bull brake. And please, let's if you know what a Pit Bull brake is, you nod your head, but it was, it was the worst. <laughs> and um, I wrote the guy, because keep in mind, I couldn't afford to call him. We yeah. didn't have email. I wrote him a letter that said, Mr. Gowen, this brake bridge is too far away. And he sends me a letter back that says, you're an idiot. Why are you are? And then two weeks later, I get another letter from him that says, well, I went back and measured. Turns out I'm an idiot. And I made <laughs> I made 100 bad frames, and you have one of them. So <clears throat> send them back. But um, like Chris Moeller used to have a company called B&E. And I know you've interviewed Chris, who's a great interview. Mm-hmm. And, man, he was running around getting anybody to build his bikes. And I was running a, I ran a little bike shop called Squidco, a little mail order shop in 1990 and 1991. We worked with Chris and people would call us like, oh, I want a Challenger or I want a dirt bike or I want a Holmes. That was actually your only three choices. And you'd call Chris and you'd be like, man, I hope, A, I hope he's got it. Mm -hmm. And B, I hope it comes out straight. And, you know, I hope it comes out in the color that, that you wanted, because if you made a mistake, it was a month to turn it around. All the parts were terrible. Everything was bad. It, we had a great time, but I can't. It was like uh, someday, Brent, you should do something where we get a, a genuine vintage bike from all these old school guys who go to the fairs and stuff. Yeah. And you should spend a day riding Rays with a 1988 GT Pro Performer or something. I would love to do that. I mean, I think your girlfriend would probably want to dial 9-1 and get ready to complete the call, right? <laughs> none, none, none of this stuff could handle. I mean, uh, when, I was, when I was in school in 1990, I was doing loading dock drops. That was a big thing. Mm-hmm. I realize now people do that in and out of a trick, right? But, you know, I'm riding off these loading docks. It's three feet, and I would land, and then I would pull over, and I'd get my spoke wrench out, and I would true the wheel, 
and I'd go back out and do it again. Oh, wow. And if I didn't do the tr wheel truing and retention in between every drop, then the rim would buckle and I'd be out of wheel. And that was on 48s, which, you know, another ridiculous idea. That's wild to hear about. And it's right at that time, just before, like, Standard started and really the companies at, with Standard at that time started to really make bikes that <clears throat> they tried to not have brake. Yeah. Yeah, the STA, the original STA 500, which... Oh, and, and Brian, I realized the the limitations of this format, I, I kind of wanted to go around my basement right, and drag all this stuff up, but I've got... I've got dirt jump frames that were eight pounds. Yeah, holy cow. I mean, they're just, and, and the, um, when Odyssey did the first thermal fork, it was two and a half pounds. Like, oh my God, dude, a two and a half pound fork that doesn't break. You know, what are we <laughs> yeah. going to do with all this technology? You know, it's just, it's just too much. Well, uh, we don't live very far apart from each other these days. So That's we could, true, yeah. we could do a follow up and, uh, could give me that tour at some point. Yeah, I think, you know, my brother's got an Auburn, a two-piece Auburn frame. I don't know if you ever saw those. GT did a couple of years where they made two-piece BMX bikes. The idea was you would get the rear triangle that matched your riding style. And we've got, and he was GT co-factory in, in 91. So, uh, I'm sorry, 1990, so 14, 14-year-old uh, rider. And so we have this perfectly preserved top shelf 1990 Auburn. And I really want to have you ride it. And I don't want you to ride it too much. I don't want you to get hurt. I don't want you to lose like half a season to this thing. But <laughs> it, um, I, I hope if I could get all of your listeners who weren't, who are not that age to ride something like that, then I think you would go through and look at a BMX action and not laugh so bad. Oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think about that stuff whenever I look at old pictures and videos and things and just you kind of look at it in all of what people were even able to do on those bikes yeah and and also one of the one of the things is it's just amazing to me how i watch a guy like uh, gage sharp and i will i will admit i watch more of his instagram stuff than any other rider because i don't think i can do any of it so it doesn't hurt my feelings <laughs> and he does he does stuff in and out of tricks that we any of that stuff we could have done it for two seconds you know we'd have made a print zine about it made 500 copies asked everybody to give us a dollar for it and driven to nationals to hand them out um yeah it used to be there are no rolling tricks like there's this guy um kevin jones in the plywood hoods mm -hmm. Uh, Dorkin and York videos. Somebody showed me a Dorkin and York video for the first time. I went home. I couldn't even get on my bike. Like <laughs> this stuff that that we'd always done static. You know, tricks like lawnmowers, Miami hoppers, all mm -hmm. that. This guy was doing them on the roll. He was doing basically, you know, a rolling Miami hopper kind of. And um, but the progression is unbelievable. And sometimes I, I watch you or I watch Gage or somebody. I think, you know, honestly, what's what's left? You know, what what is um, and you're in endlessly inventive, right? I think what you do, 27 tricks to turn 27 or something like that? It was... I usually do dumb stuff like that. Yeah. Like if I hit a milestone on YouTube, I'll go and do that many tricks. Yeah, we didn't have anything like that library. I mean, gr growing up, we like you, uh, like your average Columbus Trails rider, right? We had a place called AMA where uh, mm -hmm. Todd Lyons, Lawan Cunningham, um, people like that, right? And honestly, so... Everybody could do a cross-up, not an X-up, but a plain cross-up. Most of us couldn't do it. I didn't learn X-ups until I was 24 years old because until then I didn't have a frame long enough to get oh, my yeah. handlebars past the seat. Um, you know, I just couldn't, you, you would just, you know, you'd hit your, your handlebar on the seat. So, but do it, you know, you do a cross-up. You, if you had the right combination of bike and rider, you could do a Leary, which is now a turndown. Um, you know, people did tabletops not all that flat honestly mm -hmm. we just didn't have a huge trick library and everything we didn't string tricks together ever you'd work on one thing you'd tell all your friends you could do it they'd say you're a lion you'd go <laughs> out you'd do it or not do it because you, you never pull up I, I my big thing i went to these the uh, thing called lawnmower where i'd ride in and out of the lawnmower perfect and I can do it right now. I swear to God, I go to my basement and do it right now, but I never did it in front of anybody who I respected without <laughs> falling off the bike. That's funny. I know how that goes. You, you could do it first try, 
by yourself and then you go show somebody you go to film it and it takes you two hours yeah and once once you mess up once in front of a camera you don't get any any more confident about it <laughs> it's funny yeah yeah i'm all too familiar with that man uh <clears throat> so at what point did you move up in racing to get to the pro rank well this is so this is kind of embarrassing right i was um I was a pretty good, I was a pretty good intermediate racer. I broke my neck. I was on a training ride. I got whacked by a truck. What? And, um, you know, it, was, it, it was so bad. It wasn't even breaking the neck, and I broke it up up top, second cervical. I got hit by this guy. Avoids my buddy who's crossing the road. Hits me. I'm just sitting there looking like an idiot. The it's a lumber truck, right? So I get underneath it. I get tangled up in the wheels, and then the back bumper of the lumber truck. Do you think what that looks like? It's kind of like a bar. Yeah. It basically sticks into my back, snaps my neck, and drags me face down for 100 feet. And um, I, almost, I was in a coma for three days. And so if I came out, Whoa. and they, they, they did this thing called a femur nail, which they'd never done in Columbus before, because my right leg was all in pieces. So they put it back together on this titanium nail. And um, all sorts of stuff. I was, I was, when I went in, I was, I was six foot three. When I went out back out, I was six foot two, and I was 108 pounds. Whoa. And um, so naturally, I wanted to start racing again. And I tied my crippled right leg to my pedals and uh, was just riding around the neighborhood. And so after two years, I got my pin taken out and I went back to race. And all my friends were experts. Like it was like everybody I was racing against were gone from intermediate to expert. So I started racing with them. And um, <clears throat> I started writing for Bicycles Today magazine, which is kind of the, the in house racing organ of the time. I don't even know what the equivalent is probably Pull Magazine, which mm-hmm. is the USA BMX. And I started covering the pro races because people wanted pro coverage. But another thing, Brent, you got to understand is we were the first generation to, to be adult BMXers or to grow up in the sport. Right. You know, and if you could go back, there's so much talk about the dads, right? The dads ran everything. Yeah. There's no, there were, riders didn't own companies. You know, there was Moeller who was kind of the first one to do it, but riders didn't own companies. Riders didn't run tracks. Riders didn't have any say. It was all. It was the dads who did everything, and the dads used to write the race coverage. So I started writing the race coverage, and people kind of enjoyed it. Some people. I remember uh, these guys, Charles Townsend and Gary Ellis. These two names were probably lost to time, but they were GT pros. These guys cornered me at the Grand National, said they were going to kick my ass, <laughs> and they could have done it really easy. Charles Townsend was like uh, 6'2 and 240 pounds. I think Ellis. Ellis, you could stand behind Ellis, you wouldn't see him. They used to call him the lumberjack, and. Um, but I liked covering the pros so much, but there were things about the pros you couldn't cover because you couldn't get in practice with them. They were separate. And I thought, well, I've won a couple expert races. I'm just going to turn pro so I can get in there with them and cover the race, mm. which is a brilliant idea. And I went to the NBL. And they're like, well, your, your record is a disgrace as an amateur competitor, but we're, <laughs> we'll let you try it because – you have your own health coverage, right? I'm like, yeah, because they used to have health coverage for pros for like $25,000 in medical. They're real explicit. Said, you get hurt, we're not paying for anything. Don't don't apply for it. <laughs> and um, so I started doing, I started riding with the pros and, and reporting on them and listening. And I never, I, I never won anything. I never made a pro main. I made it out of a moto, out of a qualifier like twice in my life. We used to have these... Um, we used to have these money opens at Pacer BMX in Delaware, Ohio. And guys like Billy Aw, Barry McManus, who um, runs Trailside Bikes, now, or uh, Trailhouse Village in Indiana, and went out in Indiana. One of the greatest natural riders. This was a guy who could do, he was maybe 6'3", 250 pounds, and he could land a jump in a manual before anybody knew you could do that. Brilliant guy. I like watching an elephant do stuff, but... And I was in with all these giants of men, right, who were knocking me around. I had stood no chance, but I did, did you know, learn about sport and, and uh, hang out with them. And I uh, then turned vet pro, which is a race thing. And in in '02, I did I did vet pro, and I just got smoked. I kind of thought it would be easier. Vet pro was harder because those guys were lifting every day. Yeah. And that was when I realized I was I was a, always a never a great BMX racer. I was a pretty good car racer. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to ride for fun and I'm going to do the pro racing in the car. Um, but I learned so much. And again, there's so so much stuff that's hard to explain now about riders trying to take control of the sanctions of the sports of trying to have our own say in what happened. And then the funny thing was a lot of us turned into dads. Like I did mm. my son, you know, raced for a while and rides 
And then all of a sudden we saw the other side of it. Yeah. <laughs> and which, what I realized was that the dads, like it or not, are kind of in it. They're kind of in it to stay as long as their kids are doing it. Whereas you might have a guy and there's in Columbus, we had this big thing where the racers, the riders took over the track from the old men. And we had a couple meetings and it's like, Oh my God, finally, no more fat dads telling us to do stuff. And somebody's like, yeah, who's going to roll the track this week? And I'm like, Oh hell no, man. I'm, I'm going to Louisville to ride that, that full <laughs> pipe. You know, no, I'm going to South park to race. Well, I was just going to, I gotta, I gotta work at Wendy's, you know? And, we realized pretty quick why you have the dads because the dads actually show up. Mm -hmm. And so now it's kind of an uneasy thing where like, I think a lot of places are now run by racer dads, you know, because they'll, they do it because their kids are doing it and they're also dropping a gate. Mm -hmm. And, but we fought so hard for any kind of autonomy to even have, I mean, imagine this, a freestyle contest where every adult, every judge is a 40 year old who's never ridden. Yeah. Well, <laughs> sometimes that I feel like people, talk like that's the case i can't say from experience that it is but yeah i that's crazy to think about it was the rule i mean it, it wasn't even like oh my god i can't believe it's like it this time it's like that was how it was you'd, you'd go there and and the judges would be dudes who never ridden a bike and you'd have to educate them you know i'd see guys like uh, taj mahalik or, or whatever mm -hmm very patiently educate this is harder than that you know yeah. um i can't express to you how much harder a one hand or no footer is than a no footer you yeah. know and th things like that and it was kind of a nightmare and and you know, not nothing about bmx is ever a nightmare we're riding bikes and having fun but it was it was hard in the sense that to have riders who um who are who have some power and a guy like uh, Daniel Durs. Now, I think, am I pronouncing it right? How's he pronounce it? Daniel? People say Durs. People say Dares. Dares, yeah. I mean, this dude's got, this guy is still young enough to be competing, and he's got his own place. Yeah. Which is amazing. You yeah. know, you think about it. Just, you know, back then, we, you know, you'd have to go to a place like Woodward. And for years, Woodward was entirely built and operated by people who had never cranked, you know, never turned a wheel on a bike. That's crazy to think it about is crazy. that. It, it sounds like I'm making it up. But some, some of your readers go back, oh, yeah, it's not true. It is. It was true. The bikes were terrible, and we had adults telling us what to do, <laughs> and nobody could manual. I mean, nobody. Todd Lyons could manual. That was it. Nobody else could manual. That is funny. So I want to go back to this BMX Today or Bicycles Today, whatever it was called, writing for them. Like, Is that where the writing thing started for you, or was it before that? Uh, yeah, it did kind of. I, I was, so I was getting coached by a former pro named Scott Stevenson who ran part of the National Bicycle League. And, and I went, uh, this is, this isn't really an adult tale, but some of the guys are gonna laugh. I went into the NBL office to pick up Scott's so go ride trails. And again, I want to emphasize the younger readers that trails meant four foot gaps, nothing higher than the desk I'm talking to you on. Mm -hmm. And there's this gorgeous young woman with this John Updike novel sitting there reading it. And I'd read the book. I'd, the novel just came out. I already read it. So I went up to talk to her and I hadn't gotten the memo that, well, at the time, if you wrote BMX, you, you had no chance of talking to a woman. So you had to take every chance. <laughs> it's, there was no credibility to it. It, was, it literally, if you were 18, you're like, I rode my bike at my university every single day for four years. And the whole time, Everybody in my fraternity, everyone in my school, literally thought it was like my little brother's bike. That, well, dude, are you gonna are you gonna get rid of that that Harrow Sport and get a real bike? <laughs> like, no, this is my real bike. Anyway, gorgeous woman reading the books. So I walk up to her, like I'm, I just finished that book. What do you want to know about it? And she ran BMX today. She was like 28 years old, an older woman, very sophisticated. Um, and I now have bikes in the basement that are older than she is, but. Um, yeah, so she just like, just on the strength of the fact that I'd read this book and that I was a pro, I held a pro license, she let me write. And I wrote whatever I wanted to, 2,000 words a month, and the parents would go nuts. We'd get these hate letters. Because so I'd talk about how just stuff that seems like, oh, you shouldn't hit your kids if they lose a race. <laughs> and we'd get these handwritten letters from, from rural roots, like where I live now, the sticks. <laughs> You, know, you think you can tell me how to discipline my son when he won't try hard enough in a race? You know, um, you know. I, I wrote something like, "We should have some riders own the sport and uh, 
uh, Rich Long, who owns GT Bicycles, calls up my boss and says, he keeps running his mouth like that. We're not going to sponsor any nationals next year. But you could say things that were in no way controversial and have people jump down your throat. I did race coverage, and I forgot to mention who won 25-29 Cruiser. And this was back when that class was a joke. I mean, right now I think 25-29 Cruiser is as fast as single A pro, but back then it was guys who had started racing when they were 25. Mm -hmm. And this guy's son, he was a track operator, and his adult son had started racing, and somehow he won a race. And I didn't mention it. And he writes in and says, how come you didn't mention 25-29 Cruiser? So I'm like, I open up my IBM PC. I'm like, Mr. Jones. As a professional in this sport, I assure you that 2529 Cruiser is nothing but a pale shadow of genuine adult BMX competition. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so then he called up the guy around the NBL and said, I'm taking my track to the ABA and stuff like that. So oh, my. It was, it was a lot of fun. And um, it was based on that, that. That made me think I could run a mail-order bike shop. So, you know, I, I, I did that. And I was running the mail-order bike shop just kind of – we didn't have a physical facility. We just appeared at races with a with a – vw van full of stuff that was the greatest time that was so much fun yeah tell me about this mail order bike shop deal so like you just said you didn't have a like a brick and mortar location how do we do it uh, yeah just tell i don't <laughs> okay I'm, just saying, I'm, not, I'm not making this up it sounds um, it sounds to me like i'm making it up i was running um i was running the bmx team for a bike shop in hilliard ohio called cnb bikes and this guy, he didn't know anything about BMX, but he, all his business was BMX. And he didn't want to go mail order because it frightened him. And this was back when Dan's was coming on strong. And you had Frankfurt BMX in Girard, Ohio, which was nationally prominent. Mm -hmm. uh, Rockville BMX, which I think people still talk about now. hasn't you know, They've been dead for 30 years. But <clears throat> So I said to this guy, Ray, I said, can I use your vendor contracts to buy and sell stuff? And he said, well, yeah, but you got to pay me in cash ahead of time, which is reasonable. I was 18 years old. Yeah. So this is what my, my brother was 12. So I, every month I put an ad in BMX Today magazine that I, I, I printed on a dot matrix printer and cut, like, shrank and pasted on a copy machine and then gave it to the magazine. They put it in. And then if you called during the day, you either got my mom, who would tell you to call back, because I was working. I was working for Ford Credit uh, in between uh, going to school. Or you'd get my brother. My brother got home at 3 o'clock. So my, my brother is 12 years old, would take your order. And because he was a jerk, he would argue with people. You don't want a TNT Pro frame. Those things break. <laughs> and so then he would write down all the orders. So I would come home from Ford Credit at 445. And we, we would immediately get um, the, the Ohio distributor on the phone before he closed at 5 o'clock. That was uh, Billy Danishek at System Cycles. And we'd, we'd file the order. We'd call Seattle Bike Supply, which is Redline and a bunch of other stuff. I think SBS. They ended up owning Redline. They're like a big deal now. And um, so we'd call up or I'd call Moeller, you know, which getting Moeller on the phone was hit or miss. And order with him. And then we'd go to the bike shop. That and get the stuff that had been shipped to us previously. We'd unpack it, repack it, go to the UPS on Treview Road by 6 o'clock and ship everything out, and then call people at home and give them the tracking number. And we did this every single non-race day for the better part of a year. Wow. And I loved it. And we met so many great people. We you know, met, met so many great riders, did so much stuff. And my father... God bless him. I know he's not watching. He didn't even. I was I was on national television in Malaysia racing for real money. He didn't bother to watch. I know he's not watching this. <laughs> he um. He comes to me. He goes, let me tell you something, Jackson. This this BMX thing you're doing, it's for losers. It's and there's no future. And this bike shop thing, you're doing especially has no future. And I'm like, Dad, I'm actually getting somewhere. Like business is up. And he says, well, who's the, who's the market leader in, this, in the segment? Excuse me, businessman. I said, Dan's competition. He said, how much does Dan's competition sell? And I had a, I had a vague idea from the distributor. I said, he's selling $750,000 a year of parts. He says, that's, that's, not a, that's not a net sales. That's a salary. That's how much somebody should make. That's not, that's not how, many, how much <laughs> bike parts you should sell at a 5% margin. Because we were giving stuff away. I mean, we, had, we kept no margin. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, I want, you to, I want you to get rid of this and go back to work. So 
I called, I called all the distributors, and I quit, and I went back to work. And that was in 1991 and a half. And, gosh, I want to say in 95 or 96, a company called Alloy bought Dan's Comp. And I think you had a podcast about kind of the history of Dan's, right? A little bit, yeah. And I don't know if they went into this, but the original Dan himself, um, he sold out to a, a venture capital firm called Alloy. And they reportedly paid him um, between 8 and $10 million for the shop. Jeez. And keep in mind, we were, we were killing these guys, not in volume because we couldn't do it, but we'd have people leave Dan's and, and deal with us. We, we, we made these T-shirts that said, friends don't let friends ride at Dan's, which seemed very, <laughs> very uh, edgy at the time. We called them dips competition. Um, at one point, I, I had this Land Rover that I, I – pulled into a BMX race and blocked their storefront with for a day, just left it there. And then it was like down the, down the pit lane with my stuff. I'm like, yeah, well, they're pretty busy over there. You should come see us. But so I called my father. So I want to let you know that this bike shop that we were beating the hell out of just sold for $10 million. And I'm never taking your advice about anything again. <laughs> wow. That is crazy. So, just to think that how different things could have been if you had kept at it. Well, yeah, I could have real money. I could be, um, I could be running in the Le Mans Prototype Two Challenge. Um, <laughs> wouldn't have that neon anymore. Wouldn't have that neon. I'd, I'd, um, my my current my my big race car. It's the, the it costs about three thousand dollars an hour to run. So I really got to think about turning it on. And uh, I, I I could just run it all the time. I could go everywhere. If I had that could kind you of money. Daily it. Daily, I absolutely daily. It. I could, uh, I mean, I'd have to keep in mind it has an inch and a half of ground clearance, but um, you know, I could have somebody go ahead in front of me and flatten the road. That kind of money. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, That's, this is where I'm gonna call my dad and yell at him again. He's still alive. I think he'd like to hear what I have to say. I could be driving my race car every yeah, I day. Yeah, be a success, Dad. <laughs> That's funny. So that was '91. What comes between that and uh, the website. Well, so um, I was writing BMX Basics for the National Bicycle League, and it did pretty well. I mean, it's hard to tell, you know, who liked it and who didn't. But in beginning of '97, and I'd always been kind of a tech guy, and I was aware of the World Wide Web, and I'd, I'd done a little bit of stuff. And so, like, I think in February of '97, I opened up a BMX Basics website where I would just also type in that month's column for the magazine mm -hmm. online. And in, initially, there was not much of a BMX web. A lot of it was on America Online because, let's face it, BMX people, we've always been trash. You know, we, we don't keep up with the, the latest and newest stuff. We're not, um, especially not back then. Like, so we were on, BMX people are on America Online way longer than the expiration date. And they'll be on Facebook way past Facebook <laughs> expiration date. Too. You'll have BMX dads on Facebook 10 years from now screaming into the void. Nobody's there left to, to read the post. But so uh, so I tried this website and, you know, I had this little counter and I'm like, gosh, I hope somebody comes to see it. And I think after the first month, let's keep in mind, all I do is mention it on in the magazine. Mm -hmm. You know, I had like 10,000 people read it. I'm like, well, that's pretty Jeez. nuts. So we, ke we kept going and I had other people. I had a lot of international people. And back then, people would somehow get an issue of BMX Today in Singapore or something. Then they would write me a letter that would take three months to arrive asking me for something and I'd write back and you have this correspondence you hear two things from them a year mm -hmm. and once we're on the web that kind of picked up and, and so Australian riders send in photos Sing Singapore just had a brand new BMX scene in 97 they were just getting started there now they have a, now they have real BMX over there but um, all these international countries and it kind of became like a little a focal point we didn't have any discussion forums it wasn't time for that yet but and then eventually I registered Initially, it was infinite.com slash jboswell. So I was writing under the name Jim Boswell because uh, GT Bikes had had me kicked off with my regular name <laughs> from BMX Today. So they brought me back under a pen name. But um, they, were, they were right to do it, too. I said their hubs just I, – I wrote, this hub sucks. Somehow they printed it, and then, of course, they got rid of me. I should have known that was going to happen. And the, the GT hub did suck back then. It had these stupid – collars that you had to tighten with an allen key and you had to hold the whole thing like you had to pinch the whole thing in your hand and tighten it up that again i can't explain horrible. how bad this stuff was but um anyway so 
I had BMXBasics.org, and then I quit in '97. I quit writing the thing for I quit writing for the for the magazine, which went fully online. And by then, uh, and uh, sorry, by '99. And then by then, there's like a BMX internet. There was BMX Mania, a guy named Jerry Landrum. You had a couple. Uh, you had a couple people who were doing BMX race sites. Free, uh, freestyle and trail riding was like slow to come up. Back then, the only way you knew what was going on with trail riding is you'd you'd have to wait to get a video, like a VHS mm-hmm. cassette. And sometimes VHS cassettes were so bad, like there's so much stuff that didn't deserve to be captured on on <laughs> tape. Yeah. There's this video, and if you haven't seen it, Brent, you have to come over and watch it. It's called On the Down Low by uh, this guy called The Gons, Mark Gonzalez. I haven't seen it, but I've heard of that name. Yeah, and it op- I mean from a rider's perspective it opens with him doing a maybe a 12 foot drop to flat i mean something nobody had ever seen yeah but before that there's a 45 minute soap opera starring him and his girlfriend what? that was like this homemade movie about this love triangle between him and her and some other dude and we're watching this keep in mind we'd pay 21 dollars for this video mm-hmm and like there are 10 of us in a room watch this. Nobody wants to speak up and say fast forward this BS <laughs> because, you know, what if the great writing starts and you miss it and then the tape breaks or something? So we all sat there quiet as a mouse, almost like we're watching, you know, a dirty movie. And <laughs> at one point, you know, Gon's also trying to make out with this chick and everybody's like, you know, you don't have your phone to look at or whatever, so mm-hmm. you don't want to talk. It's super awkward. And then after 45 minutes of trash, Gonzalez jumps, a ra- a bunny hops a three foot rail and does a 12 foot drop to flat. And we're like, Oh, thank God. Now the riding has started. <laughs> um, there was a, there was a video called, uh, I'm, I ain't mad at you. The East coast ballers tape that had a bunch of BMX pros flexing on a beach and talking about how their competitors were penguins and then like riding sit down wheelies. <laughs> like you, and again, you couldn't, you had to pay money to see it. It was 1999. It was mm-hmm. terribly at no choice. Um, so anyway, so there was like freestyle, uh, street, street and trails were slow to come on the internet. And, uh, you had uh, dig BMX, I think, which was one of the early ones and BMX board. Mm-hmm. And so I kept that site going. And then in 2004, like I said, I went to, I went to Woodward to ride, um, cloud nine, which I was really excited about. They just built it. And I actually rode, rode cloud nine lot eight with Jamie Bestwick, who was a, I mean, he's a monster now, but he was a monster then. He was, mm-hmm. he was doing, he was doing these huge alley oop airs just right. I just, just walk up. Oh, hey, hey, boys, how are you? You know, fine weather we're having. Just walk up, drop in, and do a, an alley oop air eight feet above the coping, and then get out and go. Oh, what's for lunch? You know. Um, so I went and rode Cloud Nine. I dropped in on Cloud Nine, and my knee just gave out. I'm like, man, I'm done. I don't belong here. I'm not. I'm not riding at any kind of level. I'm just going to quit. So I closed the site, let the domain expire, did nothing with it. People said, do you want to sell it? And I'm like, I'm not selling it to you. BMX isn't really about that. Just go out and build your own great website that's free. Mm-hmm. And that was so stupid of me. I should have sold that too. <laughs> hindsight, right? Yeah, hindsight. Don't don't give away your YouTube channel, Brant. Oh, that's great advice. <clears throat> I will not do that. That's funny. So... It, at what point you told me that you designed frames and parts at what point in time did that happen so that would have been from uh, 91 to about 95 okay so and, who was that for so i had my own idea called the generic superbike and a lot of this is race stuff i want to kind of gloss over it but nobody knew anything about bmx frame geometry we just didn't and this, era, this thing like Mike Laird does now where you go on his website and you say what geometry you want, there's none of that yet. Mm-hmm. And some of the geometry choices were so bad. A lot of the bikes had five inch head tubes, which is just ridiculous. My first bike had a 15 and three quarter inch top tube. I was six foot three. Whoa, that is short. Every time I took a, when I come out of the gate racing, my belt buckle would hit the top tube pad like immediately. Half of the crashes back then were just people falling off the front of their bike in midair, or falling <laughs> off the back of their bike in midair. Um, wow. The bikes were so bad, and the uh, free agent limo, which came out in '87, this is it was 19, 19 and three quarters inch top tube. Nobody had ever ridden anything like it. It was a complete revelation. More importantly, it had a short back triangle, mm-hmm. 
And the combination of the long front end of the back triangle was and is the gold standard of street trail race bikes. But again, there were years where people ignored it. The first actual copy of the free agent limo was the S&M Holmes, which was a... The only reason it wasn't an exact copy of the free agent limo is because Muller couldn't find anybody who could weld consistently within two or three degrees. So it was supposed to be a complete copy of the free agent limo, <laughs> but it wasn't. It was just kind of like near a free agent limo. Um, <clears throat> so I was of the opinion that you could do a 21 and a half inch top tube with a 14 and a half inch rear triangle, which nowadays is something you can order from Planet BMX with 10 different names on it. But back then was like saying that you should be able to fly using only your hands. So uh, I, tr I tr did all the drawing, did all the CAD, um, tried to get people to build it. In the end, the guy who built some of it for me is a dude named Bill Ryan at Supercross BMX. So he did a couple kind of test frames that I still have in my basement there. Half paint, half chrome, which I thought was neat because, you know, I didn't know. Chrome is so bad. I mean, I love chroming a BMX bike, but it just ruins the durability of the thing. I think half of the reason we broke so many bikes back then is because they were chromed and they were badly heat treated. And the chrome process itself eats away at the tempering and the surface strength of the steel. So mm -hmm. you really have to know what you're doing. And we didn't. We had no idea. Um, then I had this amazingly stupid idea for something called the Razor Bike. And I was, I was obsessed with the idea of a quarter pipe or... BMX race ready $149 bike. Oh, like I, I spent, I thought about this night and day and I'd corresponded with the, with the people who ran a company called Santana cycles. who would kind of re, uh, revitalized tandems. And I talked to uh, the breeze people. I talked to Alpine stars. I'd corresponded overseas with English bike manufacturers. Keep in mind again, all of this is one handwritten letter at a time yeah. and you wait. And, if you ever stop by, bro, I'm going to show you my letters from Moeller. And Moeller and I would write each other, and, you know, three months would go by. And, you, you know, you, that's the only way you could talk to the guy. Or mm -hmm. it's, it's write a letter. And and if he didn't feel like writing, he didn't write. I mean, you've met him. This is not a this is not a man who lives his life in the literate fashion. And sometimes I just get drawings back. Like, what does this mean? But anyway, so what I wanted to do was I didn't think actually I knew that you could not do a genuinely race ready bike for 149 bucks just by making stuff cheaper, which is how everybody did it. You take a frame and you make it mild steel. You mm -hmm. have a quill stem, you make the shaft of the stem mild steel, and then you press fit the, the top of the quill stem on and you do it with a hydraulic press. And you don't swage it or whatever. And you save 51 cents that way. And then you do a single, you have a, what they call a single angle bend, in the handlebars so instead of like a uh, sharp and out you have it like that and that's a lot cheaper because you only have to have one bend angle in the handlebar you just flip the thing as you're bringing it through mm -hmm. all sorts of things they did to make things a little bit cheaper but they didn't didn't result in a durable bike so i sat down with this early cad program and i went through this whole thing about a bike that existed in tension so you would have rear cables instead of chain stays that would be tensioned by turnbuckles against a bottom bracket and then drilled through the bottom bracket to a bolt. Whoa. And the whole idea was to save the cost of tubing. And then it would strengthen the, the seat stay by putting it under tension. And, one of the, and this is, it's like, if anybody's watching this, they're like, Jesus, I'm going to get off this thing. But <laughs> one, of the, one of the critical bicycle construction principles is some materials are strong in tension, some are strong in compression. Mm. Uh, as a real example, wood has no tensile ability to it. You would never want to, like, suspend a car on a wooden beam that had something drilled through it was hanging off it. So, <clears throat> so steel is good in tension. Steel is not good in compression. You can bend a steel bar much easier than you can pull it apart. Mm -hmm. Aluminum is the other way around. Aluminum is much better in compression than it is in tension. Uh, carbon fiber is good in tension, but only in the direction of the weave, things like that. This was all stuff back then. If you went to any BMX race or any 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 day at Woodward or at Louisville or whatever, you'd see people break bikes. It just happens. See frames mm -hmm. break. So I went and looked at every frame. How did this break and why? So <clears throat> I ended up writing this 80-page document about how to build the perfect $149 bike using all new ideas. It wouldn't be interchangeable with anything else. It wouldn't be just like a crummy department store version of a great bike. And then I sent it to every bike manufacturer in the world pretty much by mail having paid $3 a piece. And I waited 
uh, for the tidal wave of people who wanted to make this $149 bike for kids. And of course, nobody gave, nobody cared. Nobody was interested in it. Nobody wanted to retool. Nobody wanted to take the risk. But I was obsessed with the idea of making BMX affordable. When I was still at, I was at Miami University making $4 an hour and uh, made, making lunch for my more fortunate students. And I would go buy like Team Murray's and stuff and fix them up and drill them and give them to local kids and take them to a race. And I was just, it was like, and I could only do so much as one person. And I was obsessed with the idea that if I could build a bike that any kid in America could ask his dad for, and if his dad you know, had any kind of job, he could get it for him. And because people would drop out of the sport because their bikes broke. Yeah. And I bet that's still happening, right? You know. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> if your bike breaks, it's, it's super demoralizing. And if you can't afford a new bike, you got nothing. So my, my idea was this $149 bike that a 120-pound kid could jump over a 10-foot tabletop and not have the forks buckle or have the wheel come apart. And, and I just thought it could save the sport. And, we, and, and as you, you've probably been told by the old guys like, like uh, Grom Dad and those guys, <clears throat> man, the 90s were pretty hard in terms yeah. of rider count. And I thought we could just make it cheaper. <clears throat> you know, we could... <clears throat> make it affordable for everybody yeah and um <clears throat> so now you talk some of the cough you're good here I'll, I'll mute you you can cough all you need to uh that is crazy not only need to hear about the concept behind that but somebody also said here that they saw a vintage mountain bike that had a tension cable for a down tube yeah <clears throat> All right, unmute me now. You're good. Forget mountain bikes, dude. We had that was a rip off of a BMX bike called the Jack Slingshot. And the idea of the Jack Slingshot was that it had two tension cables for a down tube. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that <clears throat> when you came out, the bike would flex as you're up against the gate, and then it would spring out and give you an additional two percent power or something. And needless to say, these things broke the minute you looked at them. <clears throat> they're hugely valuable now. I can't I mean, find a picture of one. Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> I think JAX Slingshot, maybe. Oh, okay. Nope, that brings up some women's clothing. That's crazy. Well, either way, it sounds insane. I also never... Never underestimate mountain bikers' ability to ruin something. <laughs> you gotta understand. I spend the, I spend more time riding. I don't even, I don't even ride twenty inch at rays anymore because I'm, I don't feel I'm coordinated enough. I'm riding. A, I think every time you see me, I'm on a ordnance or Mike Laird dirt jumper. But, mm -hmm. um, mountain bikers will, will spend an infinite amount of money on nothing, and that that has always been true. And the worse, the worse we are as a rider, the more expensive we got. Like. <clears throat> I, th I might have seen this on yours, but I got this thing called a Trek Session 9.9. It was $10,000. And I've cleared one 42-foot gap on it. When I say gap, I mean, there's absolutely something underneath me. I was not taking a chance. Mm -hmm. But I was like 007, right? I was no talent, no style on a $7,000 bike. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, slingshot BMX frame is what someone told me. Yeah, to Slingshot, Google. yeah. It's it's out there. I mean, it's, again... <clears throat> Oh my God! We had, we what had... in the heck is yeah, that? Yeah, it doesn't look real, does it? Why? And of course, it didn't work. It didn't work. It was like the Addix plastic sprocket, or um, <clears throat> what? Any number of terrible ideas we had back then. That just looks like a really bad crash waiting yeah. to happen. Okay, so <clears throat> BMX has always tried crazy things. Oh, yeah. I mean, gosh. Um, you know, the mag wheel was the original crazy thing. If you think about it, <clears throat> that... Um, was that... Did that come after normal wheels? Yeah, well, the so the Mongoose Moto Mag was one of the first purpose-built BMX bikes. I think it was 1974. Mm -hmm. And the, the it was a magnesium wheel, which is why we called it a mag wheel. Okay. <clears throat> and it was... I've got one. I have, I have an original Moto Mag. 
it is it's three pounds man it's heavy as hell yeah and then skyway and then skyway acs and peregrine did a, a glass fiber nylon wheel the tough wheel the peregrine master the acsc mag z wheel mm -hmm. but yeah the original mag wheel was magnesium because all those wheels immediately went out of true so something like a magnesium wheel seemed like a good idea okay that's crazy I didn't realize that normal wheels came first, then the mag came out. Well, yeah, so the first BMX bikes, in theory, were the Stingrays. I mean, I, I'm guessing you've seen, like, the opening mm -hmm. scene of uh, on any Sunday. <clears throat> and for years, you know, Len Caston did the first Unicrown fork, I think, in 74. Motomag came right after that. And all, all these bikes sized for a 10-year-old. Yeah. They're all hugely fragile. They all, <clears throat> and this is, I could talk about this way beyond anybody's ability to hear it. Uh, but <clears throat> they were all crippled by this idea they had to be dimensionally identical to a twin Stingray because that was the default race bike. Oh, okay. So, like, I don't know, do you ride a mid-bottom bracket now on your yeah. bike? <clears throat> yeah, um, right. I think BMX is pretty much all in the freestyle world switched to mid. Yeah, um, I've got a mid on my layered frame. But we didn't have, <clears throat> we had a one inch threaded headset, mm -hmm. because that's what a Stingray had. You had the big shell, non threaded bottom bracket, the diameter of the axles, 3 eighths inch axle, that comes from the Stingray, mm -hmm. the original seat post diameter, 7 eighths, because that's what a Stingray was, <clears throat> and all this stuff. Even if you get a, you know, you get a brand new BMX grip right now, whether it's like uh, ODI, long neck, or something. That will go fit on an original uh, Schwinn Stingray. The tubing size of our handlebars is literally from that. Yeah, seven days. Um, this I was at the workshop of a guy named Chip Foos a couple of weeks ago in L.A. Who's kind of a car guy who's been on TV. Mm -hmm. I've heard of him. And he was showing me this Redline BMX bike he restored, and he he raced BMX and and repainted BMX bikes before he got into cars. And we were going through, and he says, what's a modern bike like? And I said, man, a lot of this stuff still moves over. You know, particularly, we, we, we had a 14-millimeter axle thing for a while, but I don't know, who's riding, is 14-millimeter axles, what percentage of the market is that? Well, for a rear hub in a freestyle yeah. bike, it's like 90%. It's universal, okay. Yeah, I would say. Probably I, more um, than 90%, honestly. Okay. Because my dirt jumpers are three eighths now, and my my Laird frame is a fourteen. Yeah, when it comes to the dirt jumpers and other bikes, they're probably different. But freestyle bikes, I feel like you kind of need it more. Yeah, I would say so. And when the fourteen when the fourteen mil axle came out, it was actually kind of a godsend because people broke axles all the time. Mm -hmm. and, so you were talking with Chip about fourteen mil. Yeah, and, I, and yeah, we we're talking about how much the stuff still moves over, like. How, how much stuff you could take off his 1975 Redline that he's got in his shop and put on a modern BMX bike. Was it a and lot? It's, it's a fair amount. I mean, a lot less now than 10 years ago. Yeah. Like the, the advent of disc brakes, <clears throat> you know, brakeless riding being kind of the, the default for most people in freestyle. Um, the headset, I'm embarrassed to say that I... I wrote a whole bunch of stuff in public about how the headset was a stupid idea and would never work like a threadless headset mm -hmm. because the original heads, the headsets were so bad That's and they were, funny. they were, they, you couldn't keep them tight and you couldn't keep, you couldn't keep tension on the stem and the original stems, the clamps were so bad that a lot of them relied on that little stupid top cap to put tension in them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you'd see, cause you see somebody come off a big jump at AMA or something and the whole bars had come off and they'd be, uh, they'd be loose <clears throat> or you had all these three piece forks and we had a guy so the the national uh, christmas classic and the national championships used to be in columbus uh -huh. down and one year i was sitting i was racing racing uh vet pro i think or something and we see this guy go over the jump in, in the first straight and his forks come apart like his legged forks like crown forks mm -hmm. and when he lands and he's wearing an open face helmet so it was an era of open face helmets and he lands, and it puts his jaw through his windpipe. So it's like the jawbone just cuts his windpipe off. And um, so somebody who's been waiting to do this their whole life, I think, cuts his windpipe and jams a tube in there. 
and yeah. that's what saved his life. But like all sorts of stuff would just just completely break on you for no reason in yeah. the early headset and, and Crown Fork era. Whoa, that's crazy. That that's super crazy to think about. I mean, I I feel like we're definitely very lucky to have bikes where they are today. Well, you're doing a lot more with them, and the, the two go hand in hand. If um, it would be when I when I see when I see people ride, even like he, even um, some of the young guys you ride with, like a guy like Gage or whatever, mm-hmm. he couldn't have done any of that stuff on a on a Hutch Trickstar. You know, yeah. you, the bikes just weren't reliable enough. So, it's you guys are making full use of it, which is is great to see. And even even me, I mean, I'm <clears throat> I hit bigger stuff now than I'm 51 years old, and I my son and I went to Bentonville to that Riveter. Yeah. And I was hitting stuff at the Riveter at 14 years old. There's nobody in America who would have tried that stuff. You know, the, I think my, my kid did the last jump at Riveter. And I paced that off. That's almost 30 feet. Mm-hmm. And in 1986, if you did a 30 foot jump, A, they would have, you would have been on the cover of BMX action permanently. <laughs> you know, they would have named GT would have named the bike after you. You would have had to have had your own clothing line. And it would have been, and now there are, you know, 12 year old kids doing it, not really thinking anything of it. So, mm-hmm. so it's kind yeah. of neat. It's crazy to talk about the evolution of things. And I mean, from what I'm gathering here, when you're talking about how you write about, uh, you've written about like the headset and, and things of that nature, it, it feels like you've kind of always like pushed against the the grain of like with your own personal beliefs of things towards what you feel is right and i kind of want to talk a little bit about that but i also want to get your perspective on the bmx industry today if you pay attention to it at all i i do and i i think my perspective on it is that <sighs> It's great to see people doing stuff in sh- small batches stuff, but I can't stand the fact that the whole industry is overseas. Mm. And I can't stand the fact, I mean, listen, I so I I recommend Sunday bikes to people. Like somebody comes up, man, I, you know, I'm 18 years old, I wanna ride half butt, go get a Sunday sound wave. You know, you know it's not gonna break. Mm-hmm. But when I, I keep spreadsheets to see what my bikes cost like so my son i had um he he's on his defcon 4 but you know you know who i mean what's his name the guy who built the bikes for gabriel burns um oh it'll come to dutch dutch bikes okay oh yeah yeah so i had him build a park bike for my son i went through and we did titanium everything it was like 3900 dollars mm-hmm. and <clears throat> i keep track of what everything costs me all my my layered bikes my dirt jumpers and all the stuff is too expensive Every, everything and <clears throat> I gotta think and I'm just I made the same mistake 30 years ago I'm gonna make it here now in front of you I gotta think there's a way to do a $500 bike in America mostly that you could ride at the outside line at Profile World and not have it break in half it just has to be I mean wh- why else have all these CAD cam cycles available why else have all this small batch m- manufacturing whatever right yeah, it's hard to say because there's a lot of things that this like literally there isn't a single one made for a freestyle BMX bike in the U.S. Like yeah. ti- like tires, 20 right. inch tires you literally can't get f- that are made here. Uh, rims, I don't know if there's a single freestyle rim made here. I know there's other like racing rims. I think there's some carbon rims that might be yeah. made here. Velocity makes a great double wall, 26 inch. This is a this is a commercial message, Brant. Okay. Velocity rims in Grand Rapids, New York, or Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm I'm 245 pounds and I can do loading docks without breaking them. So, but mm. they don't make a 20 inch. Right. So yeah, I don't I don't think there's an American 20 inch freestyle rim. Then pedals, at least. Yoshimura, de, five dev. But, but that's rare. Expensive too, aren't They're they? They're super. Yeah, you, I have a bunch of Yoshi pedals. Man, I, actually, I gave David Lieb a set of Yoshi pedals because he couldn't get a set. Yeah. I'm never going to get those back. Those are <laughs> those are 200 bucks. Right. The whole bike should be 500 bucks. But what it is is, and we see this in other industries too, where people think that USA made means boutique. Mm-hmm. So only boutique stuff gets done here. Every Huffy sold in America. Every $99 Stu Thompson BMX bike was made in Dayton, Ohio. Front to back. All the parts. 
everything made in this kind of River Rouge style production facility. Mm -hmm. And those bikes were trashed, but they were trashed because they were ninety nine dollars, not because they were made in America. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, when I when I look at the industry now, I see a couple things. I see um, a huge focus on identical overseas stuff where they just slap some kid's name on it. Yeah. And I see very few riders making an effort to learn how to design and build their own parts. I think you have the OEMs are just so focused on it. I mean, when when you have guys who are 50 years old, my age, designing BMX bikes, that shouldn't be. I don't. I can't ride like you. I don't know what the bike needs. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's part of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's definitely a lot of that catalog type stuff that exists. There's a, there's a fair amount of people who are having input on their own stuff but there's also a fair amount of people who are being told by the companies like this this is going to be your thing <laughs> like yeah so that's you know, that's kind of my beef i think we should do more of it here and i think um and i don't, I don't know i'm not going to speak about the, the whole edit craze and you got to drop a new edit stay relevant or whatever i understand every everything's based around social media now i mean Everybody wants other people to see them ride. It's just kind of, you know, I, I will say this. I kind of miss the days of going to the trails and not seeing a single video camera or GoPro or whatever. And I'm as guilty of that as anybody else. My poor son is the most over-recorded human being in history. I won't let him take a single downhill run without turning the GoPro on. <laughs> so yeah. I, I understand that, but. You know, a lot of what um, a lot of what you do at like Apple Creek and stuff is about getting people to just enjoy the sport in the moment. Mm -hmm. And anything we can do to get people enthusiastic about it, just to, it doesn't matter what a great rider you. I mean, you're actually I remember you're super encouraging to my my idiot son who completely underpedaled and nosed into that opener <laughs> at Apple Creek. And um, and the the. It, it was kind of funny. Cause he, was so, he was so angry with himself. Like, just do it again. It's like, no, no, I'm not going to embarrass myself in front of Brant Moore. Um, but, you know, we have more stuff in the moment and let people know. Not everything you do has to be um, – like, this is this guy, Devin Smelly, and I used to work with his – his dad, Chuck Smelly, owned a shop called Board and Bikes. They were an early mosh dealer. And I, I bought and resold a lot of mosh stuff from him. And I, mean, I watch what Devin can do. You know, it's not even human. Right. This guy's doing like a 180 re reverse manual onto a rail and stuff like that. Um, and you can have so much fun in BMX. You can have so much fun in BMX if you can't bunny hop two feet. Mm -hmm. I've seen people enjoy BMX for 20 years who can't. I mean, what's it, uh, Steve Crandall, right? The FBM guy. Yeah. I think he rides a little. He rides a little bit now because I see it on. But man, there. Were, when I was racing pro, he didn't ride. He just held a camera. He just drove the van for people. Mm -hmm. And that guy enjoyed the heck out of BMX. Yeah. Still you know, does, you know, yeah. Still does, right? And you don't have to be, you, know, you don't have to be able to do a, um, gosh, just trying to, who I thought must have been Gage, who did a flare off a, like a park transition or something. So this is harder than it looks. I'm like, well, that must be terrible because it looks like nobody can do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting perspective. I kind of want to talk more about the the bike thing because like there's i think the the bare minimum for what i would really really suggest to somebody who's like serious about riding is kinks whip bike which is full chromoly frame fork bars sealed front and rear hub double walled rims mid bottom bracket integrated yeah. headset and it is 550 bucks so Yes, yeah, so that's a little bit above like the entry level fit stuff, right? Most of the fit stuff is like three ninety nine. Yeah, and the top of the line fits four eighty, I think. Yeah, <clears throat> I think. Yeah, I, t I, I tell I tell like kids under twelve to try the Sunday Primer, but with the understanding they're going to break something on it mm -hmm. as soon as they go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and it's. Yeah, that that kink whip, right? It's all pretty generic stuff. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's all no name stuff one of the things I, I don't understand is this is probably too detailed for what you're talking about but this idea that everybody every bike now has to have a crummy copy of profile cranks on it <laughs> why why does why does every 199 bike in america have to have bad three-piece cranks on it 
I think three piece cranks are just the standard. They they are right, but the, the here's the thing: there's a lot of there's a lot of cost in three piece cranks. Yeah. And <clears throat> one of the things that we did, I think, better back in the day was you had a, a forged one piece crank, which was eighteen dollars, mm -hmm. and it would bend but not snap because it was forged steel. And actually, most of them were made in Ashtabula, Ohio, and had Ashtabula stamped on them. Hmm. And and you could bend them back. Yeah. And the, I, I would say that the biggest failure I see up at Ray's with people with cheap bikes is the uh, the boss weld from the crank from the crank boss that slides onto the the axle mm -hmm. to the box to the box of the crank. That's that's been a failure point since the Redline Flight Crank came out in the age of the dinosaurs, and it's it's no better now by taking the absolute cheapest steel you can find in Taiwan making it paper thin so you can quote a low uh total weight and then indifferently welding it on you know in the dead of night while somebody holds a gun to your head mm -hmm. yeah it's i don't know it's tough because those budget bikes are just always going to be like that and i feel like at least in these days even the cheapest three-piece crank might still be better than a one-piece at least in riding it go how i don't know uh, we may have to test that, Brent. We're, we're going to get a set of Ashtabulas and have you jump them. Like I said, they bent. They bent all the time. They're never true. Yeah. But they didn't snap on you when you landed. And again, the way I see riders get hurt, if you think about all those concrete floors at Ray's and Mike's and places like that, last thing you want to do is have any kind of interface with that concrete floor coming in, landing off a jump. Mm -hmm. you know, you'd, you'd be better off hitting your head on the rafter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... That's interesting. What what do you think as far as what you pay attention to? I mean, we talked a little bit about it already, but like the stuff BMX could do to help itself. I think, well, if, if, if I'm going to put racing as a, racing is a, is a different thing. Racing has its own problems that nobody cares about in, the, in, the, in your listener group. The most important thing to get, for young people is to get them on a bike that doesn't break mm -hmm. and to put them in an environment where people support them. And I think Ray's goes a long way in that direction with some decent, they have decent rental bikes. I mean, those are, I think those are kinks that they rent up there most of the time. Right. Yep. And I think, um, what would be really neat and not, not to get political, but in the past three, four years, I've seen companies spend, seven eight nine figures on stuff for various feel good cred you know no matter which side of the political divide you're on right so <clears throat> if some if some company were to say and this is something that I, I used to do individually at, at race tracks when i was in my 20s i would say if anybody showed up who's racing for for the first time i would pay their entry fee no questions asked mm -hmm. if they didn't have a bike i had one bike available for them to borrow i think it would be great if you had some maybe you know uh red bull or or monster or something like that just flat out say any kid in america who's under the age of 16 you show up to a place like ray's pump track or whatever we're going to do something to put you on a bike and, and get you going because it's the school sports make that possible right if you like you know i, I don't recall paying much to play basketball at Dublin High School back in the day. Mm -hmm. You know, my brother played, uh, my brother won a state championship in football, and we used to joke that that you know, it cost him less to play football for four years than it cost us to run the Christmas Nationals <laughs> on a BMX bike. So, you know, the competition is funded externally. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't hurt us to be funded externally as well. And, you know, if I, if I ever, um, you know, if I ever sell a book or something or get a, a halfway decent executive job, I would um, I would make it possible for kids to come in at Rays. And time and time again, I, I've seen kids ride at Rays all day, come in in the morning, go, you know, beginning to night on a rental bike, doing everything they can. And I'll talk to them because, you know, you know maybe I'm, I'm old and tired. But I, I need it, I got to rest for like 10 minutes between those profile world <laughs> runs. And I'll talk to people. And, um, or, you know, like, you know that downhill run from the top uh, where yeah, everybody the, sits up there? the green line. Yeah, I can do that. Well, I can hit that, like, six tables, and then I got to go up and sit for ten minutes. Yeah. So I talk to people, and I'm like, you coming back tomorrow? And surprisingly often the question is, no, this is all the money I've got. 
So BMX BMX is like crack, man. It sells itself. Mm-hmm. And if and if the the two things that kill kids in BMX are they can't afford it and <clears throat> they get I think the current phrase is gatekeeping. You know, people treat them like trash because they're riding backwards on the pump track or because they don't know the rules or they're in somebody's way. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, they're not very good and they're embarrassed. And, I mean, God knows that, that you and your guys and, you know, Horeki and people like that do God's work in, in keeping that from happening, right? Yeah. I, you know, I, at the Lebanon, I think I was there, you were at the Lebanon pump track a long time ago. The one in... Um, the one north of Cincinnati, the, uh-huh. the tour down read it. I haven't been there. I think it was it was <clears throat> it was some young rider who, just, who was working there all day with people, and he never got to ride. You know, mm-hmm. might, I thought it was you because it was the kind of thing I thought you would do, but <clears throat> it might have been um, no, it might have been Gage. But anyway, this idea of if the older riders who everybody respects, if you guys take ten minutes out of your time to focus on a, a twelve-year-old or a ten-year-old, <clears throat> and you know, for every kid, and this is something we talked about before, and for every kid whose father is determined to mold them into the next Devin <laughs> Smilly, there are there are a hundred dads who don't understand, don't care about it, don't don't support it. My dad was like that. My father never, yeah, you know, he just supported any high school sport I did, but he hated BMX. Yeah. <clears throat> and so anything we can do, if you see a kid at the pump track, he's ninety percent of the way to being a rider. Yeah. And I try to do it, but let's let's face it, man. I'm I'm old. I don't ride all that well. I don't have a huge amount of credibility. I look like somebody's dad, which I am. So when I when I talk to some 15 year old about, hey man, you want to, you know, I see you're trying to get around the pump track. They don't want to listen to me. They're they're surprised, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm not, uh, you know, there for diabetes treatment or something. So it takes it takes the younger riders who have credibility to sit down with them and, and work with them. And if you do that with a couple. Those people will come back, and they'll figure out a way to do it. Yeah, yeah, that happens at Rays. I I see it a bit where we we're, we're hanging out, and a younger kid's there and goes and just try and give them guidance on whatever they're trying at the time, and and it's been cool to see those kids get older and get better with time. It is a, the thing that I the thing that's easy for me to forget, and maybe for a lot of adult riders to forget is. Raise is hugely expensive. Raise is what twenty-two dollars a day. I think it's more than that now. It, it might be more than that, and I think there the number of kids in America who can't put their hands on twenty-two dollars a day is probably a lot bigger than the number of kids who can. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the stuff has to happen at like that new um, that new trail in Cleveland. Uh, yeah, I man, that's a hell of a place. That's incredible. <clears throat> yeah. But when I went, my son and I went to Cliffs right when it was getting dark. All these kids riding backwards, crossing the track or whatever. And then you got a bunch of 18-year-olds up there cussing at them mm. and not really offering any advice. Just like, get off the get off the trail, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think each one of us, I, I, start, I started in BMX because there was a guy in my neighborhood who raced BMX, and I wanted to be like him. He was cool. He was 17 years old. He drove a Fiat convertible. I wanted to win races like him. And by the time I was... 16 and he was 19 I could have I could have coasted two pedals out of the gate and still beat his ass I never think he was that good <laughs> but you know we get started in this you might you might come out because you saw a video or something or because you just like the bikes but it's the interactions of riders like you that make that make permanent riders out of people mm-hmm. and as weird as it sounds the kids like uh, what young Huck Kerensky, those guys, those guys, the kids who are really getting it done don't need any encouragement. They know they're getting it done. They know they're doing a great job. Um, you know, the kids who have a lot of talent, the the 12 year olds who are clearing all the blue line stuff in the middle at Rays, those guys don't need any encouragement. They know that they know they're doing great. But the kids who are back wheel bunk in the uh, the beginner section, mm-hmm. you know, who are making that weird kind of shifty motion when they pull up. Yeah. Those are the people you have to focus on because they're the ones who are at risk of quitting because they're not seeing any progress. <clears throat> and then you go home and then they can play, you know, Call of Duty Warzone with you and me, right? And to some degree, and this is something I talk to my son about a lot, the video games are so good now that they're so rewarding and they're so easy to stick to that even I have trouble. I mean, I should have been, at, I should have gone to raise this week. I didn't go to raise. I sat at home playing video games. Yeah. Now imagine, 
imagine you're 13 years old and you can't get over the, the beginner section at Rays. You're absolutely just going to drop in uh, Al Mazra and play a little bit, right? So Oh, so you're going to do something else. Yeah. Else. So it's so like I said, I try to encourage kids, but I'm old. I'm I'm completely uncool and. Um, so what I ask is anybody, any of any of your guys you ride with, or whatever, please pick some loser, some fat kid, some guy on a on a um, what do they call the next bikes? The next mm-hmm. next is like the current terrible bike. Spend half an hour with a kid on a next bike when you go somewhere, and that that kid could be the kid who ends up. Well, I'll tell you tell you one thing. You know the the Dayton thing that they just built, the Dayton pump track. Yeah. So you know the you know the kid who mostly got that through the uh, through the city council is a kid who couldn't afford a bike and I I gave him one of my son's bikes that we bought that we bought that didn't fit him he didn't like mm-hmm. I gave this kid the bike he was a terrible racer I mean he was I can't express to you how bad he was he was so bad that you'd have kids unclipping and falling out of the gate on the moto behind them because it was taking them so long to get through the track mm-hmm. I mean the if, if it was a five-person race, it would be four kids, then 20 seconds, then this kid. He's a, <laughs> he's a terrible rider. I mean, he, I just can't express how – I wouldn't tell him this, but he's so bad. I, I rode with him. I thought, he is hopeless. And uh, But what he is is he's really smart and he's really, uh, really forthright with people. And he went to the city council there in Huber Heights or whatever that is. And he and his mom – and they don't have any money. They just kind of yelled at the city council for two years until they got momentum to do that park. Wow. And so he was there on opening day with a scooter because he didn't want anybody to see him ride a bike. And I saw it because of this one kid, and it wasn't, I, you know, I gave him a bike, but there were people in the, in the community who rode with him, who, who lifted him up, who, you know, uh, encouraged him to race and stuff. And because of that, now you got this great place. There's, a, there's the pump track, which is not a great pump track. Pump track, dirt jumps, and a skate park right there in downtown Dayton. Wow. That's incredible. So anybody, you know, if you see a kid who looks like he has no business on a bike, he may not have any business on a bike, but he may he may be the kid who can get your spot built or could be the next Steve Crandall or somebody like that who can make a huge difference to the sport, even if they can't, you know, do so much as, um, you know, clear a four foot gap. Right. Yeah. I mean, you just never know who you're looking at or who's watching you or anything like that. Yeah, what's your thoughts? Somebody brought this up, and I think it's a very relevant topic right now. Is uh, what's your thoughts on free public skate parks that don't let bikes in? Man, I can't. Um, you know, I pay a lot of taxes. I've paid a lot of taxes in my life, and yeah. um, I I have nothing good to say about communities politicians interest groups skate groups who push for that yeah and you know what the the thing that makes it saddest is was when i was a kid now it is true that skaters and bmxers would occasionally scrap at like dodge park in columbus or something but we were we were downtrodden together you know right. we, you know we were looking out for football players giving us a swirly mm-hmm. and skating has become this completely like gen x dad violin class thing where you take your dopey little kid who has no business skating and you make him skate right and you buy him all the stuff you wish you had and then you go and have a skate park put in and every every skate park should let bikes in it's it's not it shouldn't be optional my son and I, we, we, we actually went and rode at Venice in California. Oh, man. Which, which is a bit dramatic, right? Because yeah. Venice has some real thug people there day and night. And he was afraid. He didn't want to drop in. I'm like, I'm dropping in once on Venice. I'm 48 years old, and what are they going to do, kill me? Yeah. And it was pretty empty. But the, the fact that you know, you and I are here, sitting here in Ohio knowing the fact that you ride at Venice Skate Park, you were asking to get shot in the face. Mm-hmm. This... Now, that being said, I have seen too many guys on a bike cause hell and havoc on skaters to not <clears throat> understand why they want it that way. Yeah. And you and I both know that if you need if you want to make a big move <clears throat> on a bike in a skate park, you need velocity. Mhm. And when you got people riding brakeless, dipping in and out of stuff at full crank, and you got little kids trying to, you know, trying to push themselves across i understand it so 
But this is not an unsolvable problem. You just say, hey, man, Tuesdays and Thursdays are bike nights. Mm -hmm. And Monday and Wednesdays are skate only nights. And if you, and I'm trying, what's, what's the park? What's, there's a bike park. I can't think of what it is. It's, it's someplace in, might be in St. Louis where they, oh, it's in, uh, it's in Utah. My son and I drove through. They have two outdoor skate parks that are bikes only. Oh. And they got these big brass signs that say no skateboards. <clears throat> and I thought that's just as bad. Right. But, yeah, we got we got to share. And again, this is what it takes to change is it takes guys like you. It takes people in their 20s who are reasonable, who who don't look like they're who don't don't look like problematic people, I guess, who are willing to go to a city council and say everybody's taxes paid for it. You know, mm -hmm. and that's you know, the amount of taxes I paid to the city of Columbus over the years to have Dodge Dodge be uh, no bikes is ridiculous. In fact, they got Columbus police enforcing it in a city where half of the murders don't go don't get I've solved. I've never even heard of Dodge being no bikes. Do if you go read the city of Columbus website, Dodge is no bikes. That's weird because I've never heard anybody. Yeah, because people either. ride Dodge, right? Yeah. But CPD will enforce it, and. Um, they, they, I think Todd Lyons, and you'd have to ask, I think Todd Lyons got arrested for riding there. Of course, because it was Todd, he's like, hey, bro, yeah, I'm just going to sit around here until somebody arrests me. But, um, <laughs> the, um, yeah, and as long as we're on that topic, my son and I, we went riding in Harlem uh, a couple months ago. We rode from 150th Street in New York down to the World Trade Center and back. Yeah. And we saw these guys ride, like the bike life guys, raising the front wheel and stuff. Like it or not, we've got to reach out to them too, and yeah. and treat them as equals. This what like we want the skaters to do with us. I you know I was in Times Square. I was talking to these four young guys on uh, on SE big flyers, and they clearly had no respect for me. I did a couple hops. I challenged them to hop as high as I could, and they couldn't, which I thought was funny. But um, we're all gonna we we need a little bit of unity, and unfortunately with the skate parks, it's not even the skaters so much. It's the municipalities. Right. So we all got to go to our local municipalities and ask for it. If you know, if you you're a taxpayer, you're a grown man who pays taxes in the area. If you got a job that doesn't is not fry cook, not, not that I haven't cooked a lot of fries, but if you know if you have a, re, a real job, then put on a tie, and go to the city council meeting, and raise the issue. And if people do it 50 times, they'll change it. Yeah. A uh, couple of things, Brian. Harecki oh, yeah, is in here. The and, great Brian Harecki, yeah. Yeah, as well as Supercross BMX. Oh, said. Bill Ryan, yeah. The the uh, Bill Ryan, the the uh, one of the founding fathers of, of mid school and modern BMX. Yeah, but uh, Brian just said he got a hundred and ninety three dollar ticket for riding a park in Atlanta and a few minutes before that he said he had a sixteen year old kid ask if he wanted to buy weed. Yeah. Well, this is a separate conversation, but enforcing bikes is always going to be easy. Yeah. It's always going to be easier than busting people for selling weed. And you have a choice. I've I've dipped on cops many a time on the bikes. I don't do it now since I'm 51 years old. I, is there a problem, officer? Like I put on my adult face. <laughs> yeah. You know, it helps if you're standing next to a Range Rover or something. But, um, yeah, 193 bucks ticket in a city where nothing gets enforced. And... You're not gonna. This isn't something you're gonna handle on an individual cop basis. I got a friend who rides at Fort Wayne, which is no bikes, mm. and he got the sticker that said my bike identifies as a skateboard. Yeah. He says, "Yeah, I know the sheriff, and he's cool, and he lets us ride. I'm like that's great. And when they reassign that sheriff, you gotta do the work all over again. So why don't you take your grown-up ass to the city council and ask them to change it for all the kids who don't know the sheriff?" Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a crazy thing. There's a current like, there's a current post from a mayor of Hurricane West Virginia who they just built a skate park, and he posted a video just of the park and a couple of people using it, and then the rules, and it says first rule is no bikes allowed at the skate park, and there have just been tons of people sharing this post and saying like go leave a constructive like well worded response to this thing. And it's just wild to see. And then there was a whole thing 
last week from a rider in Michigan talking about modern skate park and or ski yeah modern yeah skate park. Mo- modern which is bikes on Tuesday nights only I believe it's Tuesdays and Thursdays from six to eight maybe eight thirty I think it's just six to eight yeah. and they if and his post was about if a BMX rider wanted to buy a pass for a certain period of time they had to pay the same amount as a skateboarder would who has access to like literally something some crazy number of more hours per month and the the modern instagram handle was in the comments on that post saying things like if if you want more time at the skate park get people together and rent it out after our hours and then oh yeah that's a great idea yeah and and it costs three hundred dollars and they put an example of like if you get 20 people it costs only this much per whatever and and it's just like i don't know sometimes it feels like there's this this skate hate towards bmx that people are trying to claim doesn't exist anymore but definitely does exist well i gotta i gotta say i sound like my father when i say this but we gotta we gotta own a little bit of it because you got, and again, I understand riding brake lists is what's done now, and, and I'm, I'm, I don't have the skill to do it, but the number of times I've been at a park and I've seen a guy drop in brake lists and take a line that uses up 80% of the park, mm-hmm. and every every nine-year-old whose mommy and daddy are sitting there watching him be a, the next Tony Hawk have to watch the kid cower in the corner while somebody comes ripping around on their Sunday sound wave at 24 miles an hour so that they can blast from one hip to the next. Yeah, You know, we all, as BMX people, we're pretty good at minding, uh, minding our own community at a place like Ray's, right? You don't see a lot of people cross and get hurt at Ray's. Like, we all know that the really great riders are allowed to ride Profile World backwards, but you can't do it when the, when the kids are dropping in on the inside line. Mm-hmm. We're pretty good at, at minding our own business and handling our own business at places like the pump tracks and all that. <clears throat> but at the skate park... Very few riders in their teens and 20s have the kind of discipline to wait 10 or 15 minutes for a line. And, you know, talking about modern, I ride, you know, I, was, I worked in Ann Arbor for a couple of years. I rode modern on Tuesday nights. And there was a line I like to take where I had to go across the park. I'm 40 something years old. I'm 200 something pounds. I'm on a dirt jumper. And I had to have my eyes up the whole time. And about half of the time, I'd have to abort mm-hmm. for a kid on a scooter who's coming in. Yeah. And there are too many young riders like, no, nah, the hell with that. I'm going to finish my line, and these kids are going to get out of the way. And you have the right to do it. God bless you. Go out and do your thing. But understand that kid and his mom and his dad will go to the city council meeting and make sure that the next park doesn't include you. Yeah. You know, we dig, we dig our own grave for that. And it's not fair. It's not fair that we need more space to run up than the skaters do. It's not fair that so much of the stuff that – like, I think you're the least likely, you know, you do more lip tricks and more slow speed stuff and more stuff that uses a single ramp than any other rider I've ever known since Smart Naparijo. And, <laughs> um, but yet yeah, even you, man, what, you know, at that, that little Newark or Norwalk skate park or whatever near Apple Creek, I forget which, which town. Uh, Worcester. Is. Worcester. Yeah. I mean, you need to come down off one side and go over the box and go up. Right. Mm-hmm. So you, you need the whole line for that. And let's face it that that same area can take 10 kids on skateboards skateboards so we need to so what i'll say to to riders is be an ambassador for your sport which is watch your line if you see a kid coming in there is nothing in the world that stops you from going over and telling an eight-year-old kid do you mind letting me take this run and then i'll give it back to you that's you know nobody will think you're a creep nobody will think you're weird it's not beneath you to do it. It's not beneath you to go ask two kids to hold off their line, you know? Yeah. And if we all did it, then the skaters wouldn't hate us as much. I understand why they hate us. It's not because we're somehow cool and they're not. It's because we both know that in any bike and skater collision, particularly if it's a full-size dude like me or Gage or Horaki, who's six foot nine, <laughs> um, <laughs> You know the the skater loses in a really big way. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the end of my rant. I I think that bikes should be should have equal time. Yeah. I mean, God knows we can let scooters in, we can let bikes in, but again, 
from the you know I talk to guys um, you know uh, skate naked right do you ever ride there in Columbus I was only there one time before they let bikes in for just to go to a skate contest that they had because somebody from up here was going to it while I was living down there I mean I go to skate naked sometimes with my with my boy and man we negotiate stuff because you got all these tatted guys look like they're in the the crips you know skating them <laughs> there and and you go to them and go, hey, S.A., do you mind, would it trouble you too much if I went hauling ass across this and jumped these two boxes? Because I need the space. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, I go, yeah, man, but, you know, not, not too long because i got to skate too. Like, yeah. it's fine. Yeah, there's definitely an element of that where I think if people just realize that it's a two-way street in those situations and – all you have to do usually is ask it's it's in my mind it's pretty similar to the concept of skate park etiquette in an eight-year-old kid who's never been to a skate park in that you can't expect someone to think about something until they're exposed to it or someone just says something about it so it's yeah, similar it's, there's nothing natural then the the car analogy not that anybody asked for it but <clears throat> one of the cars i race is called a radical sr8 yeah it's 1700 pounds 480 horsepower it is it's an inch and a half off the ground i do 158 miles an hour on the back straight at mid-ohio the scca has me in there with these 900 horsepower camaros that also do 160 miles an hour on the back straight at mid-ohio they can't see me over their door oh, okay and if we collide i get decapitated and they get a they get a dent on their fender so when I go race with those guys, I walk around the pit and say to them, my name's Jack. This is my, this is my son. Please look for me because we're doing 158 miles an hour on that back straight. And if you move over, move over without looking, I'm going to die. It's as simple as that. There's no two ways. I hit the, if I hit the concrete wall at that speed, there's, it's, it's 100% certainty. Mm-hmm. And there's one guy, to his credit, this 50-year-old dude, who said, go to hell. I don't care what happens to you. Just stay out of my way. (laughs) Jeez. And uh, so I stayed out of his way, you know, and then, um, you know, I'm thinking, I I hope I see that guy skating it, skate naked. I'm going to knock him over. But (laughs) but, uh, the whole idea is is we can each make a mistake, but the mistake's only fatal for me. Mm -hmm. So he has an additional responsibility. For a brakeless rider going to go bowl to bowl against a 10-year-old kid who's looking to do an ollie on the flat ground in front of his parents, <clears throat> all, both of those people can make a mistake. We both know the kid will make the mistake, not you. But it's it's painful for him more than for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I feel, I feel like we've beaten this one into the yeah, ground. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's, old nope. people like to lecture, Brant. This happens to you. It'll happen to you. I do the same thing. I do it too. It's okay. But I'm also curious from your perspective because you're someone who I feel knows the at least the automobile media side of things pretty in depth. And I'm curious if you paid attention to BMX media at all. You know, a little bit, but honestly... I can't get through any of the vlogs, you know, it's like, I don't have that kind of patience Mm -hmm. and I won't watch anything where it starts off with a guy going through his house and loading up the bike and talking for eight minutes before he gets to the spot. That's yeah. Well, I wouldn't call that BMX media anyways. I'm, I mean like the stuff that a a dig posts or our BMX, that, that media, I, you know, I'll look at it to find out what products are out. But other than that, I think any, any enthusiast media in the modern era, and I know the finances of this better than most people because I ran, I ran a, a multi-million view website until recently. You're entirely dependent on your advertisers and your partners. The clicks do nothing for you. I mean, there's no – and you you know the YouTube economics, but, you know, honestly, I, I know a couple guys who get a million hits on a YouTube video and get a $420 check basically mm-hmm. for it. So it's all about partnership. It's all about co-marketing, whatever. So of course it's all trash because what are you going to do? Are you going to, you legitimately going to get up there and say, I think Odyssey heat treated forks are crap and I wouldn't put my worst enemy on one. Of course not. And of course you're going to hype whatever they put in front of you. And it's driven by a news cycle. It's driven by edits, releases, whatever. 
<clears throat> I have no I have no respect for it. And I don't I don't think you need any of it. I don't think in a scene in a scene like Ohio, which frankly is not California, it's not it's not even New York, right? What what do you need the BMX media for? What is it telling you? More or less, I guess, just uh, <clears throat> what gets shared or made by the companies that pay them. Yeah, I mean, does it help you find a part? Almost not. You know, does it does it help you learn to do a trick? Not really. Mm -hmm. Is it just a bunch of gossip and drama and people jumping off one company to another company where they both have the same factory in Taiwan? And they're putting two stickers and you got two old men running it and or you know this business about you know who's allowed to wear a red bull helmet or what you know whatnot you can i would say unequivocally and i, I say this to people i know who go racing too in the car world any minute you spend doing that you'd be better off doing something productive yeah you'd be better off at race riding your bike for another 20 minutes You'd be better off lying on your back and pedaling in the air to stretch your hamstrings than you would be reading Dig BMX or whatever about, you know, what's you know, you know, sick new edit dropped by whatever on the this year's nearly identical Sunday frame to last year's Sunday frame, uh, new colorway. I mean, what what percentage of BMX media is new colorway? Actually, probably not <laughs> a ton. Not a ton. Okay. N not anymore. It's not definitely. Anymore. It's. I would say more. So what we see in BMX media, at least on the websites, is just a resharing of content that the company who pays them for advertising made. So it's a it's an edit from one of their riders that's like the edit they've been working on for a few oh. months or a couple of years or whatever, or a promo for some type of product and things like that. I spent every minute I had in BMX media trying to explain to people the bike does not matter. That any durable bike is fine. You can win you can win a race on a GT as easily as you can win it on a red line or vice versa. And I think the same is true. I, like somebody like me where I'm kind of old and have 100 broken bones, I have some weird geometry needs and like front like I always try to ride a Fox factory front fork or something, but if you're tw if you're 15 years old you should be able to pick up any bike in front of you and ride it. Mm -hmm. None of it makes any difference. Some pedals have more grip than others, whatever, but it's all <clears throat> nothing about changing your bike will make, make you a better rider. Yeah. Unless you're talking about going from like a, a 21 and a half inch top tube with 14 inch rear end to like the opposite end of yeah, the oh, spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Those kind of changes <laughs> might affect things. But if we're talking like minute changes, yeah, it's not. I mean, I think it's it's more a disease of racing. I know I know a guy, a 28 year old dude, who can break a chain with legs, right? And he he'll ride a Mabo frame for six months, then he'll go to a Supercross, then he'll go to um, uh, Stay Strong or whatever. He's just kidding himself. That's a waste of time. He'd be better off doing another run at the squat rack. Yeah, yeah, that's always funny. Uh, whenever you talk about weight with certain things, where we were talking about like, oh, this will save you two ounces. And like, you can literally save yourself two ounces by taking a pee. <laughs> yeah, and and here's here's the other thing. And this is, again, you know, you want to come ride a mid nineties bike, but you look at guys like Dave Clymer and Jimmy Lavander, guns hitting fourteen foot drops on these these thirty eight pound garbage truck bikes. My if Supercross is still on there, my Dirt Devil, which I still have, my built-up Dirt Devil and Adam Lab 48s was 36 pounds. Jeez. Okay? And I could bunny hop at 30 inches, which is the same that I could bunny hop a bike that was 10 pounds lighter. Um, none of that. So once you're once you're once you've hit puberty, the weight of the bike is completely immaterial. People did people did everything on a 36 pound bike that you do on a 22 pound bike now. It's funny that you say this. Well, first I'll say no. I'm gonna save weights. The last thing that Supercross BMX said, I'll save that for when. You <laughs> uh, but it's funny you say that because the Wheel Mill had a mid school bunny hop challenge this weekend at their jam that they had, and Lewis Kaminsky, the guy who won it, hopped like three foot or something, maybe higher than three feet, but it was insane, and I could not jump as high as he did on that 35 pound bike on my normal bike yeah it's yeah, it's it's um i watched um oh my gosh i watched a guy named uh terry Tanette, pro bmxer hit 44 inches 
on a steel race bike. Jeez. You know, like like doing nothing on grass. Mm-hmm. It's none of that stuff. I mean, now let's it's let's face it, it's fun to do fun stuff, man. I mean, I've got my profile. You know, I don't need to ride profile elite wheels. It gives me no difference from minis, but I will get a profile elite hub every <laughs> single time yeah. because I've worked my whole life to ride a profile elite hub or an Onyx <laughs> or whatever. That's just me spoiling myself. When, I, when I'm at race, I always have people, oh, my God, I can't wait to have a bike like that. I'm like, by the time you do, you won't be able to ride it. Look at me. Um, <laughs> the, the bike is completely irrelevant. I see people doing stuff on the worst bikes imaginable. It just doesn't matter. Oh, I think every scene in the whole country has that one rider who is better than all of the rest of them on the worst bike out of yeah. the whole group. Or we he's don't. got some horrible thing. I lost so many races to a guy when his brake levers reversed. Yeah. And it was because his first department store bike, his dad set it up that way because he, he was a motorcycle guy. He didn't know any better, so the right-hand brake did the front brake. That's and he couldn't funny. change back. But yeah. you know, this, anybody else would tell you, this that'll kill you. Having your right your right brake, your front brake on your right will kill you. He won he won Grand Nationals with it. You know, that's no problem. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's fitting to say the last thing Supercross BMX said. But can you win a race in a BMW the same as you in your Honda? Uh, and what I'll tell Bill is that we all know that the BMWs cheated that year. And, um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I beat half of them with 272 uh, horsepower at the front wheel. Or the front wheels, they had 340 at the back wheels. So, yeah, he and I will have that conversation later. Bill's, Bill's uh, he's restoring these great old Shark Nose 6 Series BMWs. And uh, he's... There's a, I don't know if he'll, he'll tell you. I've I've brought out some cars for him over the years, man. Some some big irons. So he he loves his cars. He's 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 true to true to the BMW faith. That's funny. I mean, those are some of my favorite posts that you make. Is where you're literally calling some dude out and tagging him, and you're like, look at what happened with my, whatever. I, I don't know the specifics, yeah. but oh my guy, see that? And I'm like, dude, I just wish I could do that in the BMX world. Well, it, it, you know, it, the thing is, Brent, you're so, you're so positive, and I never was. And like I told you, in BMX, in BMX, we used to beef all the time. And I think, you know, Craig Billingsley, who owns The Flow? Mm -hmm. Have I told you the Craig Billingsley story? It's 90 seconds. Yeah. I, I ended his pro career. Um, oh, no way. Yeah, so we were... In 2000, oh no, gosh, maybe maybe 95. It was before that. We were at Pacer BMX in Pro Open, and he he came out of the gate bad, and I'm ahead of him, and he's getting ready to pass me. Now Craig Billingsley has a hundred times the talent that I have. Okay, he's a great rider. I'm nothing compared to him, and I know he's going to pass me, but he's trying to do it at a place that I don't want him to do it down this back straight. He doesn't need to do it there. He can wait for he can, he'd get me over the next jump where I was going to bump over like a dead man while he, you know, did an X up or whatever. He starts trying to get between me and the wall. And I'm not going to have it. So I give him a little elbow to the throat, just let him know that I'm not feeling it, right? Which is very much accepted in Pro BMX. And he starts shoving under me to do it. So the uh, the two, the the track went from one side of the barn to the next through a, a metal hoop, basically, that was like a corrugated metal wall between the two barns. So I let him get next to me, and I put my elbow on the back of his helmet, and I put him face first into the wall. And you could hear the whole, uh, you could hear the whole barn go bong when he when he hit right. And he he falls back. He's completely unconscious. He's you know choking on his own vomit. And I went on to finish fifth out of seven or whatever. And um, he comes up behind me as I'm talking to Belly Aw, takes his bike and throws it into my back as hard as he can. And thank God I was wearing the, the Cinesalo motocross chest protector that all the idiot mid-schoolers wore. Just bounces off. I'm a lot bigger than he is. I didn't think too much of it. He says he's going to beat me up. They hold him. They're holding him back. He's not trying very hard to get away. You know, it's kind of a big joke. And then he opens the flow, and I want to go ride there because everybody's talking about it. I'm afraid to go because he never raced again after that day. Like, he actually got hurt. So I wait like six months of Todd Lyons and everybody talking about how this is the greatest place in, in the world and you can't go, you know, you should go. So I show up with my Supercross Dirt Devil and he's sitting there up front and he's got this, he, he looks like an angry ferret at all times. He's got this like very determined look. And I'm like, uh, I'd like to ride here, you know. And he's like, yeah, it's, it's $11. I'm like, uh, cause I don't know what to say. I'm like, do you know who I am? Which is like, I feel like, like, um, you know, Tom Cruise, do you know who I am? 
looks up like, I know who you are. I said, am I allowed to ride here? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, yeah. And as I walk away, because I hope you get hurt, you know. <laughs> 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 and I ended up re- renting the flow from him a bunch of times. And he would come in with no helmet, do these unbelievable lines off the wall and stuff. And that, that hurt me more to watch him do that than that I ever hurt him by knocking him out. Yeah. Um, and uh, But, yeah, we, we had drama on BMX all the time. It wasn't like now. And a lot of it was because we didn't have social media. So all the drama got started in person, got resolved in person. You didn't think about it too much. Mm-hmm. You don't have this out of control thing like you do now. Like in auto journalism, I call people out all the time if I think they're corrupt or whatever. I don't care. What are they going to do? Beat me up? I doubt it. Yeah. You know, so, and, um, so what you're doing is the right way to do it. And, and I know you see people who you'd like to call out or whatever, but in the long run, the scene, 90% of the people, the scene figures out who they are and they don't stick. Yeah, I figured that out, and that's why I, I wish so badly sometimes to just say exactly what I know and what I've seen the way that you do, but I hold back from it because I've seen those people, and I know what's going to happen eventually. It's, just because I, I can't be the bigger man doesn't mean you can't be, Brant. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but I enjoy whenever <laughs> you're not, because it's like, holy crap, he said it, and I bet no one else would. Yeah, I don't care. That's crazy. Uh, Supercross said the dirt devil. I have one in the shed for you. Oh, thank God! I need a second one. One to shit on. One to cover it up with. <laughs> no, no, actually, the dirt dirt devil. You could not kill that frame, and I'll show it to you. The, the, Bill Ryan put so much thought into this thing. When you see it, you will understand why nobody ever bent one. And I don't know if you'll say. I think they did 500 of them, maybe like they were half half blue, half green. Mm-hmm. Nobody ever broke one. I saw so many people break STAs and stuff. Never saw a dirt devil break. Wow. This thing, I think he literally had it milled out of a solid piece of steel. It is that heavy. <laughs> I think we got to plan a time for me to just come and check out whatever you got going on. Yeah, before I sell it, I sold so much old school stuff, and I, I kind of regret it now, but I don't because it went to people who really care about it. I may be, you know, I may be twice as old as you, but I, I don't want to live in the BMX past. I, I want to ride now. I want to do what I can do. I want to, I want to ride with young people. It's what we did in 86 was great, but the number of guys who will sit around and talk about it and not ride now, you know, you're missing out. What, what you guys are doing now is, is as vital and as important as anything we ever did. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's all just exists in its bubble of time that people are going to talk about the same way 40 years from now. Yeah. And people won't believe your stuff either. What do you mean? Not, not everybody had a an, an, uh, e-bike assist in their brakeless bikes now. Oh, no, my God. Can you only <laughs> imagine what that's, what people are going to say? Like how we talk about how quill stems sucked versus stems today and freaking one-piece cranks and unsealed bottom brackets and all of that stuff that you guys had to deal with that today kids have no idea. I mean, when I started riding, my first complete bike it was a fit team 2006 it had a freewheel on it i never saw another freewheel other than people (laughs) bringing their bike to the trails that they had you know because some race bikes will have a freewheel that's why profile makes the elite one yeah which is a neat piece of equipment right but like i immediately moved to a cassette after that and never looked back so i I can't imagine what kids are going to have 20 years from now i'll make a quick prediction um i mentioned materials technology and i spent a lot of time reading about it the number of things that they can do now with with kevlar and carbon stranded material Mm -hmm. you're going to see park bikes that have a little bit of natural suspension built into them and don't break and it's going to because you think about the stuff people do on dirt jumpers that they can't do on a bmx bike because you can't physically take it Mm mm-hmm so I think pretty soon you're going to see forks and frames that have the equivalent of half an inch of travel in them. And half an inch of damp to travel is the difference between you doing a 14-foot drop and going to the hospital and walking away. So do you mean like it's a normal frame, but the material gives it that much yeah, movement? Yeah, and there's a company called Ibis that had a uh, frame called the Bowtie back in the day. Talking about mountain bike people pay for anything. Yeah. It used um, a flexible titanium seat and chainstay to provide passive suspension wow. with a one-inch shock that attached to the yoke of the seat stay. Huh. 
So, so what you'll what you'll see is you're going to see bikes have a little bit of natural give because you can engineer that into carbon and Kevlar strands, and that way you can't break the bike from landing too hard. And you also um, just it's just stretching the impact moment out by a couple extra milliseconds does so much to ensure your joints and your um, your body survive longer. Right, like you're saying, you know, you make it the impact of you hitting the ground, it gets absorbed over a longer period of time versus, you know, hit and splat or hit bounce a little, then come back yeah. up. Yeah. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll do a, I'll do an eight foot drop on a, on a full, a full travel mountain bike and not think about it. Mm -hmm. I haven't done, I rode a loading dock once on my layered frame about five years ago and I landed and I said to my son, we're going to coast over to the bike and dad's going to go home now. I was like, that's all. <laughs> My my uh, my um, meniscus just completely like called it a day, called it a week, really. Yeah. So even a little bit of passive suspension helps, and y you'll see stuff. Um, you'll see wheels that are formed in one piece and don't mm. bend, and that'd be a huge way to lower cost too. A lot of the stuff that you see done in carbon fiber and Kevlar now will be done with regular plastic strands in 10 or 15 years and be a lot cheaper. That's pretty interesting because we saw. Uh alienation had been working on carbon rims for years then Ecla, a company german company came out with their version of carbon rims and i feel like as it goes and it becomes more cost effective we'll definitely see more carbon in bmx yeah carbon fi and, and bill ryan can actually speak to this but carbon fiber is um the only reason his frames are expensive is because he keeps jacking up the modulus if he'd be content to sell the carbon fiber modulus they sold 10 years ago i bet you the frame costs half as much <laughs> the um but these uh the the continuing cost drop of high modulus carbon fiber is probably the bmx story of 2030 interesting and here's here's the last geeky part about it you can do stuff particularly there's no reason that a stem and bar should be separate there just isn't if you know what angle you want and you know what sweep and everything you want, that stuff can be set in a resin mold, wrapped at once, and delivered to you just that way and never change. How long do you think somebody could ride something like that before they feel like they need to replace it? Well, it'd be like like I got the, the Renthal carbon fat bars on my mount on my dirt jumpers. Mm -hmm. And my thing is you do it until you hit a rock with it and you crack the skin on it. Yeah, okay. Once you crack the skin on carbon fiber, that's a locus of, of bending tension, and that's when things come apart. But realistically speaking, the cycle life for the kind of carbon fiber that Bill Ryan's using in his Vision F1 frames and stuff, it ha it, for our purposes, it's an infinite uh, infinite life cycle. Like you should, it shouldn't be like aluminum, where every aluminum hit forms a little micro crack in the structure, and then you have over time the frames are going to disintegrate no matter what you do. There's a there's a lower bond to carbon fiber like steel that if you never exceed that lower bound, then you're effectively putting nowhere on the part. That's pretty crazy of a thought to, to explore. I think for racing, that might make a lot of sense, but for like freestyle where your bike ends up hitting the ground you know, a lot, you're going to probably find that it might not end up being worth it. Yeah, I, th I think it, it. You know, again, it depends on how much you want a light bike and how much, you know, how much is it worth to you to never have your bars slip? Is it worth replacing them once a year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that factor in what you ride. I mean, if you ride in the street and you end up bailing and your bars are going to hit the ground, you're you're probably less likely to want to do something like that where you yeah. know that it's going to get cracked quick. But if you know you got guys who are riding Cloud Nine at Woodward, you could do that on a carbon fiber bike. I actually, <clears throat> this is you know not that I'm a huge jumper, but I've ridden Profile World on uh, carbon fiber Supercross. Yeah, and well, it was fine. There's like if, if, for someone like John at the trails, who only ever really rides trails. If you only take your bike off of the dirt jumps and you never have to worry about something getting nicked or dinged like that, then you're you'd probably be okay for a while. Yeah. So, yeah, the future is pla just like in 1967, the future is plastics. The stuff, <clears throat> you know, if you think about how seriously you guys take plastic pedals now, mm -hmm. you know, Bill Ryan actually tried to do a Lucite pedal back in 95 that didn't work out. 
plastic pedals used to be a menace. Now people take them seriously. People do downhill on plastic pedals. That I didn't realize that. Yeah. I didn't realize that they were such a like. I don't know. Looked against thing. Yeah, the original major pedal was the MKS Graphite X and Graphite 2000, which used a, a woven graphite thing like a Skyway Graphite Tough Wheel. And I broke a set, and every kid I knew bought them because they were cool, and everybody broke them. Hmm. Yeah, pedals, plastic pedals are pretty awesome these days. Yeah. That was one of the things I had to get used to. Was seeing, first time I went to raise, I saw people riding plastic pedals. It was all I could do not walk up and go, you got to stop that. You're going to get hurt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love Alienation makes a plastic pedal with metal pins in them that is just awesome. Yeah, the plastic pedal with metal pins, that's like the best of both worlds, right? And you can yep. you can grind on them and you can um, yeah, it's just look for I think look for more parts to do that as time goes on. Plastic is just a strong steel in a lot of applications and if you wrap it on epoxy, then sometimes you have a material that's superior to steel. With and with 3D printing and how fast things can get turned around, that's yeah. I think that's definitely going to be something we see. But there will also be, I mean, I don't think there will ever not be a 4130 chromoly BMX frame. I think people will have them forever. Well, yeah, because there, there's stuff in BMX we do that already makes no sense, and we do it because it's always been done, right? And then, yep. and there are some people who are always going to want a steel frame. And, and I'll say this too, the older you get and the more you get hurt with every bale, the more conservative you get on stuff like that. I ride a steel dirt jumper by uh, Thomas Hosford Ordnance because in the final analysis, I'd rather have, I was riding a uh, Chromag Monk, which was really flexy. I got rid of that. I want a steel frame because just in case I case it riveter or something, I don't want the head tube to separate. I just, I don't want to spend a year in a hospital right. from something that you would get up from and walk away. Yeah. And then for, I mean, personally if my bike was any lighter than it is i would not like it it would i would feel like i couldn't control it well you do so much balance stuff i think you need a little inertia on the bike that and just like if i'm jumping a box jump or hitting the trails my my trails bike is lighter than my skate park bike because it doesn't have pegs it doesn't have a gyro it has a 3 8 rear hub so it is almost weird to whip it certain directions because it's lighter and I almost don't like that. Yeah, I can understand. But for me, the difference is going from a downhill bike to an enduro and a mountain bike. Downhill, a 29 inch downhill bike is like a, mo a motorcycle. An enduro bike is much more like a dirt jumper. Yeah. Yeah, dirt jumpers are fun. I always like whenever people are at the trails and like, hey, ride my, ride my DJ. I mean, a, a DJ is kind of like Viagra. You shouldn't use it until you really need it, and every <laughs> old guy will eventually find themselves using it. <laughs> the accuracy of that statement is kind of funny. <laughs> because it's true. I always say DJs are like a cheat code at the trails because they're they just are. easier. Well, who's the guy? I'm trying to think who was was, was uh, one of the BMX memes guys who said... Um, a DJ is like resi, and a mountain bike is like foam. Oh, yeah, I could see that. That's funny, unless you're freaking like, uh, do you follow, or have you seen anything from Dylan Stark before? Yeah. <laughs> he's he's not riding that mountain bike like it's foam. No. <clears throat> I mean, some, some of the stuff that people do at uh, Rampage and stuff, you know, jumping a 60-foot gap. Insane. You know, it's, you need a mountain bike for that, but... It, I, I have to say, I'm always surprised by how many young guys are doing people riding rivet or hitting everything on a 20 inch um, or uh, or a rail yard at Bentonville. I saw I saw a, a, a Crail, what's his name? Brooke Trine's boy, uh, boyfriend. Tommy. Uh, yeah, he uh, I saw him doing the outside at rivet or on a 20 inch, which is not something I normally think of as being a 20 inch capable thing because you, it's it's rough. Mm -hmm. And it starts with a drop to rocks, and then, and he he did it ten times. So, there's somebody out there who can do it on a twenty. It's not me though. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious too. Like, who all are you paying attention to these days in the freestyle world? I guess. I mean, it's, you know, nowadays, honestly, I, I watch Devin because I know his dad, but it depresses me to watch him. <laughs> I, I um, I'll look at some of your reaction stuff. There went the 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 Polish guy or whatever you're you're looking at a couple uh, a couple weeks Hungarian? ago. Is it Hungarian? 
Yeah, Hungarian. That guy was on. That guy was on another level. But what I most like to do is is I don't watch a lot of BMX uh, media. I go to Rays and I, I watch you guys. I watch you do your stuff, and it's hard to explain. But it just on days when I'm not riding well, or I mean, I'm in a little bit of pain all the time. Just I've had so many injuries, and like there are days when it, like it's cold and it, like I'm in a lot of pain just walking into Rays. And I'll go into Profile World, I'll see you guys doing stuff, or I'll go back into the kink room and see see um, somebody doing something pretty amazing. And to me, that's as good as doing it myself, because as bizarre as it sounds, like in 94, we were all afraid it was the end of BMX. Guys like Moeller, Clymer, uh, Taj. Like, Taj won the first ever NBL dirt jump, and I'm like, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's neat they did that before they closed the sport down. At least we tried it. Mm-hmm. You know, I really thought, I thought there'd be nothing here now. And... So now I see people like you and Matt. It's not on my shoulders now. You guys are going to carry it. And there's a whole new generation of kids who are who are, aren't born yet, who are going to think of you the way I think of Bob Haro, people like that. So I'm just inspired to watch you guys ride at Rays or you know ride some of the, the local stuff. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. And what's even cool in that too, though, is that. I've seen so many older guys coming back to BMX over the last five years, maybe even further back, where sometimes it feels like there's more older guys coming back to BMX than there are kids starting to ride. Well, okay, so that's... If bo- i got to say, it's unpo- unpopular opinion time as we say on the internet. It bothers me the old school BMX is the biggest week at race. I mean, that's understandable because you'd want, if you want BMX to grow, you want it to be more kids. We should be, I, I see too many guys that ride, not, everybody who's, who should ride, everybody wants to ride should ride, okay? Yeah. It's not that I want fewer of us, but I wish, I wish in Rays I saw more 13-year-old kids and fewer 007s like me riding these hyper expensive DJs and mountain bikes and you know, taking 15 minutes between runs and clogging up the the micro rhythm section at uh, in the red room and all that. Mm-hmm. You know, I wish I wish we were rarer than we are. I wish we made up a smaller percentage. And yeah. I mean, everybody wants to come back should come back. But when I go into when I go into profile world and I see more 30 year olds and 40 year olds and I see 15 year olds, that that bums me out. That's an understandable sentiment just because you you want those same people to be there, but you want there to be that many more younger people. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I wish they were all there laughing at us. Like, I could really use a little bit of shaming. I wouldn't mind going in. I, in my dream, I go to Ray's, and I'm the only 51-year-old in there, and they kick me out because it's their scene now, and it's time for me to go home. <laughs> and, you know, then, then I can go home and play Warzone and not feel like I'm letting the sport down. But um, we're, it's an uphill battle to get kids in. Once they're in, you know they'll stay. Mm-hmm. But it is an uphill battle to get them in. And at least we have all these facilities, man. F- t- Fifteen years ago, what was there to ride in Ohio? Well, that's... I... <sighs> I feel like that's the wrong time period to give because 15 years ago in Ohio, there was a lot of indoor parks. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, you had Ollie's and places like that. They're gone now. Right. But yeah. What, like, what was there to ride for free? I can think of, I can think of four or five first class pump track facilities in Ohio that are free 24 seven all year round. Yeah. And you go learn your, and you got the Lebanon dig crew doing their thing down there making what used to be a pretty terrible uh, dirt jump scene into something really neat. And um, so we got the opportunities like we've never had before, but it's also harder to get people interested and involved than it ever has been. Yeah, that's true. We're fighting the internet. Yeah. And it's hard, man. I mean, it's, it's so unrewarding when you start. And I wish, you know, we used to tell each other that because I started with a group, guys, we all raced, we were all terrible, and we all encouraged each other. But that's that's the thing I try to tell people now is it's not a, it's not a video game. You're not – your first level up will be unpredictable. You won't know when it, when it happens, and it's going to be a long time before you're not disappointed in your riding. But if you can if you can live through that, then you can really accomplish something. Yeah, if you, uh, you enjoy the process just as much as you enjoy – the rewards of like landing the first time getting something. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, when people tell me they can't bunny hop, I say, have you tried a thousand times? Ha. 
<laughs> if you would try it a thousand times, you could do it. Well, that's what uh, when people ask how to tabletop. When people ask that and I'm around, I'm like, you just got to try it 10,000 times and then you'll be able to do it. And, and, and you're going to be, you'd be like this. My, I, I have a lot of photos of me doing this in the air where like I'm moving my body away from the bike to increase the look of the table. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it's, it's true. And it's, um, it's, it's rewarding in a way that, that very few things are. That's, I mean, yeah, it's absolutely the case of it is just, and it teaches you so much about life without realizing that you're learning about that. If you ap- apply it to your life outside, like the, f- the failure and not giving up side of things you already know i don't have to yeah. preach it to you well but you know but you should preach it out there to everybody else and and getting hurt's part of it you know the number of grown men i know have never broken a bone how can you say that how can you i mean i, I know you don't get hurt a lot cause you know what you're doing but you know if you can't if you've never rehabbed to go back and ride doing that doing that fits you out for all sorts of stuff in life that's hard mm-hmm. yeah i just wish i didn't have to do it so often <laughs> that's why i wear pads and ankle braces and shin guards and knee pads i always get i always get hit at the place i'm not wearing a pad i broke my arm at mike's a couple years ago and um i was wearing every i was wearing every pad but it actually broke on my elbow where the pad stopped i fractured my arm and then my son's like are you okay i'm like i'm totally fine i'm gonna hit it again because i didn't want him to worry and i'm Mm -hmm. like i land like oh my god that's broken yeah (laughs) my buddy ryan's in here being a goon saying he's never broke anything that's uh, his, he's you know joking what, okay okay i'll say his day will come i i uh, i knew a guy who raced 20 years never got hurt then broke his clavicle uh and lost a state championship over it and he's like i'm 42 years old how can i break my clavicle i'm like because you didn't get it out of the didn't get it out of the way when you were a kid yeah pay those dues early <laughs> pay, pay them early while you heal yeah uh a comment here might be a good thing that we could expand on just thoughts wise industry has to find a way to draw the young people in most us old guys coming back got drawn in when we were younger yeah and so what i would and most of us got drawn in by seeing friends who rode by seeing the stuff very few people like uh wendy's had a crispy chicken nugget ad that had rl osborne doing a tail whip on a bike i mean very few people came in because of that most people came in because they knew somebody who rode Mm -hmm. you know peer pressure is still the most important way to get people to use drugs or ride a bike and if um if you can get a couple to ride then they'll get their friends to ride Mm -hmm. and um and, and and again, in this COVID era, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to explain to somebody why they should come out. You know, you, you have a lot of kids, I think, who got used to being in the home for two years. Yeah. And now it's hard to get them to come out and do something. I, w- I would just say there's no – nobody's going to do it for us. You know, if um, – I try to – you know, I don't – unfortunately, my – I had my son late. He's 13. I'm 51. I mean, we don't, I don't know a lot of young people. I, I put every kid in my neighborhood. I bought my first house. I was 29. I put every kid in the neighborhood in the BMX race. I mean, no, no, no exceptions. I got him a bike. I took him to the race. None of them stuck with it, but they all had a good time. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I would say if you're, you know, it's okay. If, you know, ask, ask your, your family and stuff, what they're doing, what their young kids are doing. If there's some, some fat kid who hasn't left his PlayStation five in a couple of years, make them go to raise or wheel mill or something. Most, most kids, most young men, particularly most young boys are just looking for something to get, get that energy out and get agitated about. Right. And the, the bike is that but they, they got to know they can do it. They got to know it's there. And they got to find it. And I, I hope find it. I hope the Olympics can help with that. You know, it would have been nice if we had the Olympics in 76 and 80 when, like, people actually watched it and took it super seriously. Yeah. I mean, Oli- Olympic BMX is insane. If you look at how fast they go and the gaps and stuff, it's like it doesn't even feel real to me based on my race experience. Mm-hmm. But it also feels like something that you're very far away from, like, locally. Yeah, it, and that's the one thing I could understand with it too and just the disconnect of like okay there's this whether it's racing or freestyle like I mean how you make the connection to that is I guess you go to the local skate park 
Yeah. I will say it's the, the one great thing about movies like Rad and BMX Bandits and stuff like that. None of that stuff really looked all that impossible. Mm. Like when you watch Rad and you see like I think the, the thing that struck me in Rad is toughest is when Eddie Fiola does a uh, 180 to roll back to 180 again while carrying his papers like his newspapers. He's a paper boy. I saw them like oh, I'll never do that. But most of the stuff looked pretty achievable. Yeah. Um, what I what I have found this is this is true for any any parents or people. Are, my son, you know, he's a downhill mountain biker. He's cleared all of 36 chambers at um, at uh, uh, Winter Park. You know, he's he's hit a 45 foot gap. He's done all of rivet or all of rail yard. But when he watches the Red Bull stuff, it demotivates him. Like for him to watch Rampage and stuff, he sees somebody drop down 50 feet down the side of a mountain. His first thought was, "There's no path between." me jumping a gap at rail yard and doing that Mm -hmm. i don't know how to get there and i'm not interested in it. it's demotivating to him so i try to focus on what we can actually achieve and do what the next step is right i think youtube might help with that and people being able to find somebody who is similar and and watching their experience yeah though i gotta say the algorithm like when i try to watch one of your videos or Every year, my, my son and I drive across the country and back, and we try to hit 15 skate parks or 15 mountain bike parks or whatever. And if I don't know anything about them, I'll try to watch a YouTube video. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and what I'm looking for is something like you go into a skate park and say, these are the lines or whatever. Too often, the algorithm almost immediately steers me to Brandon Roherick at uh, Crankworks. You know, and what I want, I want to see somebody doing something achievable. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. And, and the thing is, is just like BMX Media, there's no money in, here's the latest report from Ray's where guys you've never heard of are barely clear on the inside of profile world. You know, <laughs> right. the, all, you know all the money is in, here's the first quad backflip on, on Resi, which I have to say, I could not, and I've ridden Resi, it's, helped, it's probably saved my life, but I care nothing about what you're doing on Resi. That, like, I will not watch a YouTube video about somebody doing something on Resi, I just don't care. Yeah, it's fair enough. I, I get that perspective. That's why I don't like riding them personally. Now, when Nick Bruce is at the brew house and he does like a quad tail whip or something, and he just happens to land on Resi, I give him a pass because I'm pretty sure he could do it on a bed of spikes, you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Jack. Yeah, I've been running my mouth, man. You should let me go and get, get somebody in. else in next time. I'm excited. I got another one on Thursday. You ever heard of Kurt Schmidt? No. He is one of the people, I think, who helped start Standard. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, I don't know the full story with any of that or a ton about him, but, yeah, he's coming in on Thursday. But I appreciate you even being willing to talk with me. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe you. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'd be talking to the wall about bikes if I wasn't talking to you. My, ask everybody I race with. Nobody wants to hear about BMX. You're doing me a favor. Fair enough. Well, I want to talk more about it because I want to see all of these bikes and things that you've been talking about this whole time that you haven't been able to show. So what I'm going to say is come down. I live next to Mid-Ohio. We're in the middle of building a little jump line. It's going to be a little more mountain bikey in the sense where I can't guarantee it's going to be completely smooth. But I'm hoping to have a couple 15-foot tables and stuff come the spring. So come on down. We'll maybe put you on a crummy bike. We'll let... uh, let Victoria or somebody email, uh, video you, and yeah. if, uh, maybe it'd be a blooper reel. Oh, I think it'd be fun. I'll hit it on my BMX bike. 15 well, feet ain't that bad. I know. it's When you got to hit rocks to get there, it is. Well, all right. That's fair. We'll work it out. You can do it. Either way, I definitely want to make that happen, and uh, I appreciate your time. And if anybody wants to follow your adventures or what you've got going on, like what do you got going on to – Oh, I got, I got, don't worry, don't worry about me. Just follow, have them follow you and I'll come back and make a commercial pitch when I got something to sell. <laughs> hey, that's fair. I'm down with that. I just want to help. Come, come to Mid-Ohio. I'm the guy doing 11,000 RPM at 50 miles an hour. There we go. <laughs> All right. Well, either way, I appreciate your time. Thanks, Brent. Take care. Yeah, you too. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Good night.